None will carry on to one fifty seven Pembroke Street West, Miss Seabart. Welcome, Miss Seabart. Plan requirements, there are to be no outstanding work orders and taxes against the property. According to the fire department, there are no orders on file for this property. The treasury department does not have concerns regarding outstanding taxes. The outstanding taxes were paid in full on February 28, 2023. There is one building permit open with the building department, but it is not of any concern from their perspective. The applicant has provided two quotes for all be work being completed. According to the low quotes provided to the Community Improvement Panel, $20,450 plus HST will be spent on the facade improvements at 157 Pembroke Street West. Based on the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant Guidelines, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $5,000. Therefore, this applicant is eligible for $5,000 under the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant. According to the low quote provided to the Community Improvement Panel, $7,650 plus HST will be spent on the accessibility improvements at 157 Pembroke Street West. Based on the accessibility grant guidelines, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $2,500. Therefore, this applicant is eligible for $2,500 under the accessibility grant. Under the planning and building permit fee grant, the total fees can be reimbursed as they relate to the other work being applied for. Therefore, this applicant is eligible for $1,242 under the 201 Pembroke Street West. Recommendation of the approved grant be amended to not include the planning and building permit fee grant. On September 20th, 2022, Council passed a bylaw approving a downtown housing grant and a planning and building permit fee grant to be awarded to Michael Conroy, owner of 201 Pembroke Street West. On January 30th, 2023, an email was received from Michael Conroy, the owner of 201 Pembroke Street West. In this email, Mr. Conroy stated that the former chief building official, Mark Schultz, indicated to him before he left the position that the spray foam insulation, which was the project for which the downtown housing grant was approved for, did not require a building permit. Since the work for which the downtown housing grant was approved for does not require a building permit, then according to the CIP guidelines, the building permit fee grant is ineligible in this case. The CIP grants for 201 Pembroke Street West would be reduced by $1,482, which was the planning and building permit fee grant amount. This reduces the total grant amount from $11,482 to $10,000. The remaining $10,000 is the total of the downtown housing grant. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Fournier? I would just... Uh put a motion forward that we support the amendment to not include the planning and building permit fee to the um, forementioned application. Motion on the floor by Councillor Fernier. Do we have a seconder? Deputy Mayor? I'll second that. For discussion, further discussion? I'll call the question. Those in favor? Those against? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. See the uh, let the record note that the deputy mayor has removed himself from the chair. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Who did I say? Excuse me. De excuse me, deputy mayor. I meant the mayor. Yes, sir. Who's reporting on this one? Okay. Sorry, Colleen Sorio, but she'll be doing it by virtual. Thank you. We're just waiting for our virtual hookup with our uh, planner. Take a moment, our uh, ask for your indulgence.
Hello again, everybody, and again, welcome back, uh, Council Purcell and uh, Ms. Soriel. Uh, we understand you have a report on item C, offer to purchase a portion of city-owned land at the dead end of Willard Street. Could you please report on that item, please? Yes, good evening. Uh, Council and caucus direction was provided in September of 2022 to proceed with the sale of city-owned land to Ron Gervais. This land abuts his property municipally known as Zero Willard Street. The applicant owns a property at the dead end of Willard and along the Indian River. Uh, the applicant wishes to purchase this abutting piece of city-owned land, which is a portion of the Willard Street road allowance, to increase the size of his abutting lot. The applicant is proposing to purchase from the city a portion of approximately 304 square meters of land. The operations department has reviewed this request to determine if there's a need for the city to retain this portion of land. And it's the operations department's opinion that this portion of land at the end of Willard Street could be sold. The portion of the road allowance is unusable and is located beyond the existing guardrail. The operations department did state that the city retained 2.4 meters past the guardrail for snow storage purposes and to provide access to the lot west of 480 Willard Street. The proposed land to be purchased is uh, 2.6 meters from the guardrail, so this requirement is met and there is a survey on um, that's on this property. The present zoning of the applicant's lot and the land requested to be purchased is R2 slope stability and hazard. And hazard is from the top of the bank down to the river, which you can't build on. The R2 S means if, if there's, there's any building that goes on that's less than 100 feet from the top of the bank, then a geotechnical study is required to ensure that the land is stable enough to um, accommodate uh, the proposed development. But at this time, I don't believe the applicant has any plans to develop the lot or the portion of the city owned lands at this time. The applicant has offered $1,000 purchase of the portion of Willard Street dead end unopened road allowance. Um, it would be it is the responsibility of the applicant to pay for the survey and he did which that cost uh, $5,000. And the city has sold land in the past for $1,000 plus HST. And um, I will be bringing in a uh, report um, in the near future in regards to um, land sales. Questions from member of, members of council, Councillor Keel. So I've objected to the last two sales that we did at $1,000 a piece, uh, both of those to developers. <clears throat> but I got to tell you that this one here is just tragic. This is absurd. That a member of council will get a piece of land for $1,000 without this city council doing an appraisal without the city council offering it to anybody else, without the city council seeing if one of the other neighbors would like a part of this property, we should be holding ourselves to a higher standard than the standard that we already sort of notionally agreed uh, was less than perfect. We, we had comments during the last two cases that perhaps council should probably be getting appraisals on these properties that we should be looking at how we sell these and now we're looking at selling one of them to ourselves that is so completely improper and the fact that the last time that this was discussed was in a caucus meeting and we do this time and time and time again this council discusses things in caucus behind closed doors they tee it all up so that it's basically a fait accompli and then they come to council without any notice to the public and boom, we have it in committee, boom, we have it in council, bylaws passed, said and done and it's over without anybody in the public being able to comment on it. I am so mad about this particular one, I can't even tell you what my thoughts were last week when this agenda package came out. We should not be selling anything to one of ourselves without at least having an appraisal done. This is so absurd, I find it absolutely shocking that the last council would have even notionally suggested that we go down this road. I don't care that the applicant has already paid for a survey. This council has not entered into any agreement. They notionally, behind closed doors, gave an indication that they would proceed with this. We haven't signed an agreement. We still have time to say no. 
I will not only be voting no against this one, Mr. Chair, I'll be asking for a recorded vote. And everybody else who votes yes to it can answer themselves in the next election. Thank you very much, Councillor Keel. If there's uh, no further comments, this I'd like the Deputy Mayor to take the chair. I'll make a comment. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor, members of Council. Uh, I may uh, somehow understand uh, Councillor Keel's objection to the to the fact that uh, we're selling land for $1,000 a shot. Uh, many uh, portions of these properties are unusable, and uh, I, I feel that perhaps, uh, you know, Councillor Keel is taking it in a very personal manner, uh, seeing to the fact that the individual who is purchasing the property is not sitting at the table right now. He's removed himself. He's not here applying for the property purchase as the mayor of the city of Pembroke. He's applying for the purchase of the property as a homeowner and a resident to uh, add on to the additional part of his property. Uh, I truly believe that we have done this in the past, uh, that this particular one, if council approves it, should go through. And furthermore, that a moratorium should take place after this one to find what the actual value of land would be in the long term. We've done this for a number of years. Uh, you're proposing that it's not correct. It, I can understand your, your sentiments. It may not be correct from the point of view that it's worth $1,000. Who knows what it's worth? It may be worth $500. Would you then agree to charge 1000 That's my question, Deputy Mayor, through you to Councillor Keel. Would you agree to charge more if it was worth less? Well, first of all, as someone that deals in real estate, I would be shocked if this is worth less than $1,000. I'd be absolutely perplexed. But the fact of the matter is, councillors at this table, for the last two times, have notionally agreed that we should be looking at this policy, that we should be changing this policy. And some of those same councillors knew, because they were here last September, that the mayor, and you, I mean, I, I, find it a, I find it a little rich that a few weeks ago we met with the integrity commissioner who reminded us all that you don't get to you don't get to detach yourself from your council hat from your citizen hat and now we have the the exact opposite argument happening around this this council table the fact of the matter is he's a member of this council he would have uh, he would have had knowledge that we are selling off these properties at a thousand dollars did the other neighbor on the other side of the dead end were they given the opportunity to bid on this they might not have known like the former deputy mayor as he was uh last september they might not have known that they could have asked for this property for $1,000. They might have offered $5,000 for this property. But we didn't put this out to public tender. We didn't get an appraisal. It was wrong the first two times I voted against it. It is even more wrong this time around. Thank you. Uh, I've stated my, uh, my case. Uh, as I said, the, uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the mayor who's not sit at, uh, seating at the table at present was trying to do something underhanded or with skullduggery. He did not. I think he's an honorable man, and he's just looking to uh, add to a piece, of a, pro a piece of his property that really has no use for anyone else. Thank you. I'd like to... Sorry, Councillor Purcell, I didn't see you there. You had your hand up, and then the Deputy Mayor. Deputy Chair, can everyone hear you okay? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have concerns as well. Um, I, I think it's just ensuring that, like, was this advertised, this piece of property? Uh, is there other parties that may be interested in this uh, particular piece of land? Um, I think I've had uh, a couple, you know, questions, um, you know, during um, our council sessions in regards to how many more um, lots of land are we going to be selling off for $1,000 a piece? Um, this is the first time that I was aware um, that, um, you know, that our, our mayor is looking at purchasing this property, um, whenever the, um, uh, I guess, whenever the agenda came out, um, I'd be always the first time I'm aware that this property was even for sale. Um, so I think that's the bigger issue. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, the mayor did something, you know, uh, underhanded or, uh, you know, use the system. Um, I think the, the concern here is, is that, uh, is it fair to all citizens um, to have that same equal opportunity to purchase that land? Um, because he would have, um, you know, 
you know, prior, firsthand prior knowledge to being informed in regards to, you know, lots of land being sold for $1,000. Um, this is something that was very new to me um, whenever I uh, was elected to council. So um, I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the district for clarification, a bit of review here from before. The land on McGee Street from a few weeks ago, the homeowners wanted to buy from the city to build onto the property, which would increase the tax value, and you couldn't uh, build on it as is anyway, so we sold it for 1000 The land on Stewart Street that the developers bought, or near Stewart Street, that was a right away, and I verified with Ms. Sorrell, you couldn't build on that either. So, and that developer is building a uh, 12-unit uh, building with the vision that hopefully that'll, that'll kickstart another development in that area. So every case is, is different, you know. But I do hear what you were saying, Councillor Keel and Councillor Purcell, and I'd like to make a motion to table this um, for staff to come back with a uh, appraisal and a public notice in the paper offering the property for sale at the appraised value. Do I have a seconder? We have a motion on the floor by the Deputy Mayor to table this item and bring back more information. Uh, seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. Those in favour? The motion is carried uh, for the benefit of all. Thank you. Mr. Rono, would you ask the, uh, His Worship to come back? Item D, John Beavis Street naming request. Ms. Sorrell, are you still with us? Yes, I see you, go I'm ahead. I'm still here, yes. A uh, request has been made from Alicia um, uh, Beavis, wife of the late John Beavis, asking that the committee consider naming a street or a bridge in the city of Pembroke after her husband. Uh, John Beavis was an employee of the city of Pembroke since 1991. He was the chief operator in the city's water and sewer section in the city's operations department. Don died tragically on May 26, 2018 from a diving incident uh, during the recovery of a plane that crashed in the Ottawa River near Deep River. And uh, he was only 56 years old. John was always available to assist with after hours city emergencies. As well, he was an active participant for many city events such as the Snow Spree Polar Dip and the Santa Claus Parade. John was a staff sergeant with the OPP Auxiliary for 20 years. He spent countless hours providing motorized snow vehicle patrol. He received leadership and outstanding contribution awards from the OPP. He volunteered for many OPP events, such as Stuff the Cruiser in the aid of local food banks, participated in the OPP's torch run for Special Olympics, and OPP's bike ride for a cure. John was a water rescue diver for the Pitawawa Fire Department. He was also a participant in the Polar Bear Dip, which raised funds for the Canadian Diabetes Society. John helped raise funds for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada at the annual M&M Charity Barbecue Day. And he also delivered Christmas hampers to the less fortunate. According to the Director of Operations, the city's bridges are already named um, as they are required to be registered with the province of Ontario. Therefore, to rename a bridge would cause issues with the provincial uh, registry. However, the city does have a street naming guide, guideline in place. And this guideline states that the recognition of prominent citizens that have a long history of service to the municipality with little or no remuneration is a basis for consideration. Beavis Street is not on the city's street inventory list, but if it is the direction of the committee, it can be added to the inventory for future street naming consideration, as there is no streets um, that require naming at this time. Wishes of the committee, uh, Deputy Mayor Abdallah and then Councillor Keel. Uh, you know, reading this brought, in, when I read the, this earlier, it you know, brought tears to my eyes because I knew John Beavis I went to public school with John Beavis, and uh, then I, after he, gra he graduated and all that, he went away, then he came back and worked for the operations department for years, and I knew he was, was the, uh, he, that he was a diver, and he OPP, volunteered, and, you know, he gave a lot, and he, he died 
tragically in service to this community. So I think it's only fitting that we, I'd like to make a motion that we add Beavis Street to the name naming inventory for the uh, city list of future street consideration. It's a motion on the floor by the deputy mayor. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Plummer, discussion, Councillor Keel, and then Councillor Fernier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, a, I'm going to propose something slightly different, um, and I know I've already spoken with, uh, with Ms. Sorial, and uh, I spoke with the mayor, and I spoke with, uh, I think, Councillor Plummer. Um, I'm going to propose that we table this matter and that we instruct uh, staff to bring us back a larger policy about, uh, about naming and honoring um, citizens and workers of the city of Pembroke. Um, and I'll explain my reasoning. Um, I, I also met John uh, actually at the Polar Bear Dip uh, that I used to uh, attend when I was on the, uh, uh, the handy bus board. And, uh, and I mean, he was, he, he's instantly someone who's, who's funny and, uh, um, I mean, when you're talking about diving in a freezing cold, uh, hole and, and being in there for, for what your worship, a, ha a half hour or so, uh, while we go through things, um, you, you know that you have somebody pretty special on your hand to volunteer for that. Um, so what actually, what actually interested me in this report, and as I talked with Ms. Sorial, uh, and a couple other members of council was that, Essentially what, what we're doing because of our current policy is we're being asked to put a name on a list and for it to sit on a list until sometime in the future, some council in the future might consider taking the name off of the list. So I had, I had thought about the fact uh, that with his work with the water treatment plant that we could possibly look at naming the water treatment plant building um, after him. That of course raises a lot of discussions about the, the height of expectation before you start naming things. And it was Ms. Sorial who suggested that maybe we, maybe we take a step back and we look at, at our overall honoring policy uh, and to see if there's other options that are more immediate than just putting a name on a list that may in the future produce a result. So that's why I'm suggesting that we, that we table this one, not for, any, not for any reason not to move forward with it, but rather to see if there was something more befitting and something more immediate that we could look at than a name on a, a roads list in the future. So I would put forward that very long motion and hopefully someone was able to make a motion out of that speech. Okay, uh, Councillor Fernie, did you want to con uh, comment on the first, uh, the motion on the floor? No, I agree. I agree that we, it's great to just sort of step back and have a look at our, our policy now and maybe just revisit it. I agree with that totally. Um, after reviewing this, uh, a lot of the terminology in here is not acceptable anymore either. So I'm really glad to see we're gonna have a look at it, so, okay. Thank you, therefore, uh, the motion on the floor, we uh, need to vote on that, either uh, accept it or defeat it and then go on from there. Those in favor of the deputy mayor's motion at the present, sorry. Point of order, I believe Councillor Keel actually put a motion to table that We motion. didn't have a seconder on that? No. Oh, a seconder? I'll second the motion to table, as I, I did speak with Councillor Keel and to keep the motion. Seconded there. by Councillor Plummer, and uh, we'll, we'll have the staff come back with other information. You still need to vote. This point, of order, you need to, you use, point of order, you need to vote on the motion to table. Those in favor? Against? The motion is carried for staff to bring back additional information and new information. Thank you. Uh, Item E, encroachment request 157 Pembroke Street West, Ms. Sorrell. A request has been received from Ivan Gunter, owner of 157 Pembroke Street West, to allow an outdoor patio to encroach on the city's sidewalk. The width of the sidewalk in front of 157 Pembroke Street West is approximately 12.2 um, feet wide. The applicant wishes to operate an outdoor sidewalk cafe during the months of May through to the end of October. The proposed patio would encroach onto the city property by a width of 17 feet along the front of the building. And then the length of the outdoor patio would be seven feet. And in, upon inspection of this site, uh, this sidewalk in front of 157 Pembroke Street West is 12.2 feet. 
So the applicant would be permitted to, if the applicant is permitted to encroach the requested amount, then there would be 5.2 feet of sidewalk remaining to the curb. And five feet is the city's standard sidewalk width, and it also meets accessibility um, uh, criteria. Mr. Gunter is willing to enter into an encroachment agreement with the city, and the encroachment agreement states that Mr. Gunter would be responsible for the continued maintenance and repair of the outdoor patio, and he also agrees not to hold the city responsible for any damage that may occur to the outdoor patio as part of normal construction and our maintenance. And um, this agreement, if approved, would be registered on title and would be binding on future owners of the property. The fire department, operations department, and planning and building departments have reviewed the request and have no concerns. Uh, snow plowing will not be an issue as the patio will operate to the end of October. So the planning department is recommending the approval of this encroachment request. Um, and based on the direction of, of committee this evening, a bylaw will be prepared for the March 21st council meeting. Thank you. We have the recommendation by staff. Uh, Councillor Keel, Councillor Lafernier. I move that we accept the recommendation and allow for the encroachment. Moved by uh, Councillor Keel. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Lafernier. Have a question from the chair. The purpose of the patio is to serve what type of goods? Food, beverages, uh, food, sorry, yes. food? Yes, it would be food. Thank it you. would be like a little restaurant is what it's supposed to be. Thank you. Those in favor? Against? Carried. Thank you. Any further business before the committee at this time? Seeing none, I would ask for a motion of adjournment. Moved by Councillor Keel, second. Uh, sorry, moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Keel. We are adjourned. Hello, and welcome to the uh, March 7th, 2023 Finance Administration Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Any disclosure of pecuniary interests and general nature thereof? With that being said, motion to approve the uh, meeting agenda. Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? Thank you. Approval of minutes of the Finance and Admin Committee. February 7th, 2023. Moved by Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Lafrenier. Discussion? Those in favor? Carried. Any business from those minutes? Uh, Councillor Jackano. 
Deputy Mayor, I just want to make a statement that I'm not voting on the approval of the minutes or the uh, agenda uh, meeting because I was away. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Please note that in the minutes of record. <clears throat> Item number six under new business. We have our business li licensing bylaw up to the update for the door to door sales. We have our treasurer, Ms. Lodgety, with us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so the recommendation is that council uh, committee approve the proposed amendment to bylaw 2020-06 that's uh, presented as part of council later on in tonight's agenda. So over the past month, uh, the city has received several inquiries as to the city's business licensing policy for door-to-door -door sales, which falls under the city's transient trader definition. So it's uh, Treasury staff's position that the city's current bylaw does not adequately address door-to-door -door fees and requirements. So city staff recommend the addition of a criminal record check for transient traders, as well as a monthly fee structure for door-to-door -door salespeople. And uh, the current bylaw and proposed amendment is attached for committee consideration. So it should be noted that this report is intended to address an immediate concern of staff and does not represent a full review of the current bylaw. So in terms of financial implications, a new monthly fee of $300 per calendar month for a door-to-door -door salesperson is proposed. Um, and this is based on comparison to other local municipalities, including Armprior, Renfrew, and Petawawa, as well as the city's current fee structure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions and comments. We have uh, Councillor Keel. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lochte. Uh, so I have a couple of comments. I'm fine with the $300, um, especially if it's comparable to some of our neighboring um, our neighboring municipalities. I'm not sure why we're asking for the criminal record check because we're not saying that you have to have a clean criminal record check. We're not saying that someone has discretion to review the criminal record check. And are we saying that somebody with a criminal record from the 1980s from having a minor marijuana infraction prevents you from doing door-to-door -door sales in 2024? So I think I know where you were going from a safety and, 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 and whatnot perspective. I'm just not sure that that has been fully fleshed out. Um, but more importantly, I want to raise uh, to council, I guess this bylaw came before the last council in 2020, and my bigger concern is actually the existing bylaw. Um, so according to your existing bylaw, a transient trader shall mean any person and his or her employee who, and then there's, there's several, s several indicators of what makes you a, a transient trader, a, of course, is goes door to door to sell, lease, rent, or offer to sell, etc. And I, I think that's what we were trying to encapsulate with this bylaw. My concern, however, is a transient trader is also someone who has no permanent place of business or is engaged in retail sales but does not have a commercial storefront. If I were to suggest to this council that I take a moment and, and put my lawyer hat on, a transient trader is anyone down at the farmer's market who does not have a storefront and is engaged in retail sales. Um, it's anyone at a craft fair at the Germania Hall or the Pembroke Legion. Um, so I'll be honest with you when I tell you I have a, I have a larger issue with, with, the, with the main bylaw and I'm wondering if we want to bring the whole thing back uh, sooner rather than later because I think you in your definition accidentally grabbed quite a few people that I, I really don't think you were intending to grab. Ms. Lodge, do you have a comment, his question, or comments? Um, so, quick. so I will say in terms of uh, farmers market vendors, uh, the city has not received applications or charged vendors that are in the farmers market. Currently the only, um, the only farm, farmer type license we've granted is for the farm stand located at the Clarion Hotel and they fall under the uh, as a mobile food unit fee so they're considered a mobile food vendor 
um, and pay that level of fee. Um, to my knowledge, we have not received licenses or fees for other types such as craft fairs and that kind of thing. So um, it sounds like some of the language could certainly be tidied up a little bit. <laughs> Councillor uh, Jagano, then Councillor Keel. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, you may want to go back in the records. I think when the farmer's market was being built, there was a coalition of folks that were uh, raising food, small, you know, small gardeners, etc., who were looking for a place to display their wares. And also at that time, there was a push on by the province, Ontario, uh, province of Ontario with Foodland Canada to promote farmers' markets across the province. And I think, uh, you know, we were in some sort of an agreement. Uh, they raised funds for the building, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there were dollars that were contributed back into the community through them building the building, and we there may have been an agreement between us and the farmer's market. I believe one does exist. You may have to look. I, I mean, that's going back a few years. And I remember the councillor at the time was Councillor Lowe. Uh, she worked very hard and traveled the province to see where other uh, venues of this nature were taking place, and she brought back recommendations to make this one, you know, a fairly nice one for a small community such as ours. Now, uh, Councillor Keel's obvious, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at that particular farmer's market from the point that they're, you know, they are transient, in a sense, may have some bearing. They are transient, but the people that come into our community, and they used to come years ago with, uh, you know, tractor trailers full of mattresses, uh, post a bond for 100 bucks. Uh, take $10,000 out of the community and people that furniture stores, stores etc paying tax and water bills You know, they didn't have that ability to come and go and just leave without any repercussions So I believe the farmers market has been a part of the Integral and structural part of the the community over a number of years I can't remember how long it's been here, but it draws people into the area uh, It draws tourists etc. So from that standpoint, I would like you know, the treasurer to take a look and see, review if we do have an agreement with them rather than singling them out. Councillor Keel. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if Councillor Jackno misconstrued my comments. I, I certainly wasn't trying to go after the farmer's market. I'm saying I think this bylaw, as it's currently defined, accidentally grabs them into the bylaw. Um, so the farmer's market, them having no permanent place of business, them being engaged in retail sales but not having a commercial storefront, that according to this bylaw makes them a transient trader. And a transient trader is required to have a license. So um, my issue is not with the farmer's market. My issue is that we might have accidentally in the last council defined them in a way that puts them into this bylaw and we might not want them in this bylaw at all. In fact, I I don't think they should be in this bylaw at all, any more than the craft fairs or the, the, the bake sales or any, any of those other examples would also fall into the definition of this bylaw. So that's, uh, that's my concern. Okay, we have uh, Councillor Plummer, then Councillor Jackano. Yes, I, I just, uh, I think everyone's heard the point. Certainly no one's going after the farmer's market or the, or the craft fairs. We just want a cleaner bylaw. So I would move, motion to table this, that to allow staff to come back, clean up some language, and then bring it back at a future date so we can vote on it. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to uh, table the motion until staff comes back with clarification on the terms of the bylaw. Those in favor? Okay, motion carried. Okay, next item, number 6B. Administration user fees, interest rates, and tax deferral uh, policy. Treasurer Lodgesty. Thank you. Um, so uh, tonight, um, uh, I'm just looking for direction on the proposed changes uh, that are listed in this report. And if any changes are approved, then uh, relevant bylaws would be brought forward at a future meeting. Um, so as part of 2023 budget deliberations, uh, an update of administration user fees was discussed. So based on a review of other municipalities' rates in the area and discussions with city treasury staff, the following uh, fee changes are proposed. 
So as part of the 2023 budget, uh, staff have proposed the, an increase to the tax certificate fees from $40 to $50 each. And this would generate an extra $4,500 worth of revenue per year. Uh, other fees to be considered are NSF fees. Uh, staff is proposing to increase from $30 to $40. Uh, well, this doesn't represent a significant amount of additional revenue. It does uh, put the fee more in line with uh, the cost related to that issue. Um, as well, staff have recommended a tax account research um, and reporting fee of $10 for every 15 minutes. And this would be for research on tax accounts for more than two years and where we're required to consult our historical paper records. And we don't get very these types of requests very often, but when we do, they do take up a significant amount of staff time. And they're typically related to uh, capital gains type um, accounting or audit requirements for the individual. Uh, we are looking to increase our pet tag uh, replacement uh, fee from $2 to $5. Um, we are looking to introduce a tax rolling fee. Uh, so this is where uh, staff have to transfer um, unpaid arrears in other areas of the municipality to the tax account. And this would be similar to the $50 admin fee that's charged by the planning department right now for property standards issues. And this is anticipated to raise an extra $2,500 worth of revenues annually. Uh, the city did, staff did take a look at marriage license fees and recommended increasing the marriage license fee for residents from $100 to $125. So this would be in line with most other local municipalities and would raise an extra $1,625 a year in revenue. Uh, the non-resident marriage license fees were appropriate based on this comparison. A new fee that staff have recommended to introduce re relates to burial permits, uh, for which st staff uh, dedicates time uh, in reporting for vital statistics to the province. Currently, the staff charge no fees for this service. Um, most other municipalities do charge for this service, and the fee ranges from $15 to $20 in other area municipalities. So staff have proposed to introduce a fee of $15, which would raise um, additional annual revenues of $5,250 a year. Um, the fee for out-of-town deaths would be $25. Uh, the range in the area is between 15 and 30, and this would raise an extra $2,500 worth of revenues. Um, staff have also recommended increasing our commissioner of oath fees. We currently do not charge residents. Most other local municipalities charge $10. So staff have recommended introducing this fee, which would raise an extra $650 a year, and then uh, increase our non-resident fee from $10 to $20, which would garner another 16, or, sorry, $600. In total, if these changes were approved, uh, it would represent an additional $17,625 worth of revenues to the municipality uh, charged through fees. So staff did discuss a few other fees um, charged by some other uh, municipalities. These fees are typically charged in the larger centers and not commonly throughout Renfrew County. There's only one um, municipality in Renfrew County, County that we're aware charge them, and that's uh, to have a fee every time a new roll number is created. So this um, happens when there's severances of properties as well as for ownership changes. So while this was considered, uh, staff, staff felt this was not a very welcoming fee policy for new residents. Um, uh, I'm also recommending a consideration for the city interest rate on tax arrears. So the city currently charges penalty and interest of 1% per month on any outstanding tax, water, and sewer accounts. And this uh, penalty and interest charges collected contributes to lost interest income to the municipality. Um, cash flow challenges uh, that are created when school board payments are due, uh, but accounts charged, amounts charged on tax bills are unpaid. So a bit of background on that part of uh, the city tax bill relates to school taxes. And the city must remit these taxes to the school boards on a quarterly basis, whether or not our residents have paid them or not. Um, so that does create some cash flow issues for the municipality when it comes to arrears. Um, and it, as well, the penalty and interest covers staff collection time. So the current rate of interest charged uh, was reduced a number of years ago. 
um, and it does not reflect the full monthly interest rate permitted under the Municipal Act, uh, Section 345, which stipulates that a maximum of 1.25% can be charged per month, which is what most municipalities charge. So if, we were, if the city was looking to maximize administrative revenue, um, then the simplest way would be to increase the interest rate from 1% to 1.25, and this would provide an estimated additional revenue of about $37,500. So committee direction on this matter would be required. Um, the other area that we looked at was the tax deferral policy that the city has. So these rate discussions uh, raised questions internally regarding ability to pay. So in 1998, the city passed bylaw 98-29, which is a bylaw to provide tax assistance to certain elderly and disabled residents who are owners of real property in the city. So under this bylaw, taxes may be deferred if the property owner is receiving support from either the Guaranteed Income Supplement Program, GIS, or the Ontario Disability Support Program, ODSP. So the property must be their personal or primary resident, and taxes may only be deferred if the assessment-related tax increase for a single year exceeds $300. So to staff's knowledge, no applications have ever been made under this program and property taxes rarely, if ever, increase by this amount year over year. So uh, Councillor Plummer, as chair of the Finance and Admin Committee and previous members of council have raised questions in the past about this policy. Um, the provincial government does provide income tax relief to low and moderate income uh, residents of Ontario under the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit. The amount um, that people can receive is based on a number of factors, for example, their age, the marital status, and how much they've actually paid in energy and property tax costs. Uh, certainly the maximum benefit for non-seniors is $1,194, for which $929 relates to property taxes or $1,360 for seniors, for which $1,095 relates to property taxes. So there's also another um, grant, the Ontario Senior Homeowners Property Tax Grant, um, which is also available to Ontario seniors, and this helps offset property taxes for seniors who own their own home and have low to moderate incomes. And again, this is a maximum grant of $500 that's available based on individual circumstances. And this would be, you know, when you submit your tax, uh, income tax uh, claims at, uh, in the spring of every year. So although not frequently used, the County of Renfrew does have a similar program uh, to the city, um, but it does not have a cap. So there's no dollar threshold for annual property tax increases um, attached to the deferral. So if you are a recipient of GIS or ODSP, and clearly um, those are offered to low income individuals, um, uh, property owners can apply for a property tax deferral of any, intra any tax increases. So this essentially freezes their tax bill until they sell their home or they no longer receive the GIS or the ODSP. Um, so while this policy is administratively burdensome, it's not anticipated to be widely used if council would wish to pursue an, uh, an approach similar to the county and offer um, a tax deferral with no cap. And so a draft bylaw is enclosed for consideration and feedback in this matter. Thank you. So we have uh, Councillor Plummer. Thank you. Um, yes, as the former chair of finance, I've had uh, a couple meetings with our, our treasurer uh, over the last term to discuss this, um, just as a, as a ability for seniors to stay in their homes longer. We all know that if the longer you can stay in your home, the healthier you are, the more, um, you know, just your ability to, you know, function and everything else. Uh, is certainly we don't want people choosing between paying their tax bill and keeping the lights on or paying for food. Sometimes people, we talk, we talk about tax rates, we talk about inflation, how things are getting more expensive. And I was just looking for some sort of program or something that we could, you know, offer this, uh, offer some, you know, a select group that may require some assistance, but also understanding that there's a certain criteria that needs to be met. So it's not just, uh, 
I don't feel like paying tax because I, <laughs> I can't afford it this week, so I want to go on this program. No, there certainly is a criteria that needs to be looked at and certainly met to apply for this program, and that's why I think um, Ms. Lochte is bringing it up. So I think it is something that council should look at. Uh, we all want to make uh, do what we can to help our citizens, and if this program allows them to stay in their homes longer, uh, I think it's a good program. Do we have other comments? Uh, Councillor Frenier? Basically, I just want to echo the sentiments of Councillor Plummer. I think it, if we can help our seniors stay in their homes longer. And let me just clarify, this is only the increase to the taxes annually, correct? And that's so important because they get used to working in a certain budget. And even a very small amount can really, you know, tip the bucket, as Councillor Plummer said. Now they, maybe they can't afford certain food items they need, et cetera, et cetera. I just wish that other levels of government would see that how hard these increases in taxes, you know, can hit those vulnerable members of our population. Thank you. If I can say a few words on that, speaking from the chair, if I'm allowed, um, I fully agree, support any bylaw that uh, staff can develop to keep seniors in their homes longer and to help them with any tax uh, pressures that they have. Because that's one of the goals of senior living, is to have seniors in their homes. Um, do we have any comments on the tax rate on, on arrears increase proposal? To Well, not proposal, but... Uh, from 1% to 1.25%. Any comments on that, Councillor Keel? Um, judging by the fact that it, the estimated increase would be 37500 in additional revenue, I'm assuming we don't have that... Uh, like, it looks to me like most people pay their taxes. Um, so, I mean, really, we're, we're talking about a subset of the population that's, that's, that's not paying their taxes. Um, I think most municipalities that I see, because I, I see a lot of tax certificates, um, we might be one of the few actually that didn't jump on the 1.25 uh, uh, when it uh, when it was changed, uh, because that's that's in my head what most what most of them are. I think uh, from from seeing tax uh, uh, certificates on real estate deals, so I I'd be fine with with going from one to 1.25. It certainly encourages people to to get their arrears paid, um, and then if we're also looking at tax deferral policies, we're we're also helping. On the one hand, we're sort of leading with a stick for those people that are not paying their taxes, but we're lending a helping hand uh, to a certain other group. So I think it would be a balanced uh, uh, way of looking at things. Um, some of the other fees, uh, I they all looked reasonable to me. Um, the only one that actually might have struck me as confusing was was the the burial permit is as cheap as it is. Um, it's it seems like it's significantly more expensive to get married than it is to uh, than it is to die. Um, and uh, I mean, I know I know I know funeral costs and whatnot are are significantly large. Uh, so I for fifteen and twenty five dollars, I thought that. I was kind of wondering why maybe the, the burial permit would not be roughly the same as the marriage permit. Uh, they're both significant life events. Um, but uh, other than that, I thought this was uh, um, very commendable. I know I said during budgeting that uh, I was hoping that, that staff would, would look for other areas of revenue and whatnot, and uh, um, I couldn't be happier to see this. I think this was a, uh, a very considered uh, review of things. Any other comments in this section? So, Treasurer Lodge, do you have direction? To, thank you. Next item, uh, thank you, Treasurer Lodge, for your great professional service, as always. Much appreciated. Moving right along, under new business, item C, we have the uh, monthly report for February. Chief Sell, welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, so once again, uh, we continued with our uh, large multi-unit residential buildings. Um, that was our number one target for inspections and prevention activities for February. Uh, training sessions were conducted at uh, the MediSpa, uh, Continuing Education uh, Centre on Mary Street and the Pembroke Regional Hospital. 
Our public safety messaging this month focused on uh, carbon monoxide safety and uh, gas appliance safety, uh, especially when we're in uh, the middle of uh, you know, the heating season with February. I uh, want to make sure everybody is aware of, of the dangers of carbon monoxide. Um, and outlined in the monthly report are also a few other things that we mentioned on uh, some of our social, social media platforms. Under public relations, uh, PFD staff were surprised with a thank you banner and a lunch by Wesley uh, Community uh, Kids Venture. Uh, the lunch was a thank you to the firefighters for their service to the community. That was a very, uh, it was a very kind gesture and it was completely uh, out of the blue, which uh, certainly brought a smile to, uh, to my face uh, and then the staff's face. Um, so in, in January, um, what we did was uh, put together an idea uh, to uh, start up some type of an employee recognition program. So uh, February saw us hand out um, the inaugural winners for the Firefighter of the Month Award. So this uh, award is to acknowledge the hard work, dedication, and, uh, and professionalism of our staff. Uh, so the inaugural firefighter, career firefighter, was acting captain Brent Verdeel, and the inaugural winner and our volunteer firefighter was Sean Mahood. So uh, these firefighters were chosen by administration to, uh, uh, as they most uh, exemplified the PFD's mission statement, vision, and core values. So uh, congratulations to Brent and Sean. Uh, under vulnerable occupancy inspections, uh, follow-up inspections were conducted at Marion Hill and Pembroke Regional Hospital. Uh, under emergency management, um, the city's report submitted at the end of 2022 has been recommended by Ontario Emergency Management staff for uh, compliance approval. Official notice uh, is expected later this spring. Uh, the uh, community, community emergency management coordinator and the information officer attended a two-day uh, crisis communication webinar. Uh, staff also attended the information session on the Upper Ottawa River Dam infrastructure and water level uh, maintenance on the river. Uh, this sec this uh, session is the precursor to the kickoff of the Spring Freshet meetings, uh, which uh, focus on the levels of the uh, river during spring runoff and uh, melt. Uh, the UOC training room hosted the strategic planning workshop for two days in February. Uh, the Professional Firefighters Association in, fe in February uh, normally, they coordinate the Kids Fishing Derby in conjunction with the Snow Spree events. Uh, however, uh, due to poor ice conditions, the uh, Fishing Derby was cancelled. So the association decided to fund uh, public skating events and uh, served hot dogs and uh, hot chocolate to those that attended. Uh, the Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association also donated to the Help Johnny Get Around fundraiser to assist a local child dealing with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, February saw focused training on health and wellness through uh, some of the programming uh, we've received from our HR coordinator. Uh, other areas covered in this training include equity diver diverse diversification and accessibility training. Uh, other uh, sessions also cover violence in the workplace. Uh, in uh, early January, submissions were sent to the Office of the Ontario Fire Marshal applying for the Ontario Seal for Exterior and Interior firefighting operations for our volunteer firefighters uh, who are not NFPA certified. So uh, in mid-February, we received, received confirmation our submissions were successful and our volunteers are now recognized as certified for exterior and interior fire attack in the province of Ontario. Uh, as far as inspections and consultations for February, uh, the total number was 250. As you can see, the primary focus on that one would have been residential with the smoke alarm program. Um, the incidents, incidents were extremely high uh, for February. If, uh, if you did get a chance to look back into the annual report, you'll see that this February 2023 has been the busiest month uh, ever recorded for, uh, for calls for February. So uh, most of that would probably be, I would, I would, uh, and it has to do with the cold weather at the start of the month, for sure. Uh, and of course, I'm not sure if you were, uh, saw the uh, OPP have released a statement regarding uh, some of the motor vehicle collisions that have occurred over the last uh, little while. So, you know, there has been an increase in emergency calls. 
And lastly, there was uh, one fine paid in February, so that leaves one outstanding. Thank you, Chief Sell. Any questions for the Chief regarding this February report? Any comments? Okay, now we have your annual report, Chief. So thank you. Uh, this is my uh, second annual report. Okay, so um, if you recall writing, uh, I recalled when I was sitting down to do this uh, annual report, uh, writing uh, essays in school. And it was always, I always had extreme difficulty with the uh, introduction. The meat of the, uh, the, meat of the essay was, uh, normally came uh, pretty easily, but the introduction always gave me trouble. So I did struggle with this one and it took a while to develop something. Um, but so to describe 2022, I would say there was a lot of positives and there was also some, uh, maybe negatives isn't the right word, uh, disappointments, I did use that word, and uh, some, some daunting tasks have, uh, have been laid out for the future. So as far as the uh, pos positive um, notes, the efforts of the staff have been tremendous in 2022, uh, responding to all types of emergencies in all types of condition, conditions, training constantly to improve themselves in the department, uh, you know, conducting thousands of prevention and education activities throughout the year. Um, a couple of challenges have popped up, and uh, you know, namely, the, this is the first full year as a chief and a community emergency management coordinator, so uh, there are going to be challenges in those roles. Uh, the main goal that I, uh, I have to keep focused on for myself is to uh, remain uh, proactive in those roles and, and not be reactive. Uh, 2022 also saw soaring costs in all sectors, not just within the fire service, but in cross, uh, just incredible cost increases throughout, uh, throughout everybody's daily lives. And then on top of that, uh, we saw further demands placed on the municipalities to meet requirements and uh, regulations, and in our case, uh, specifically mandatory certification uh, with little support from the provincial level. So throughout all this, we will continue to work towards achieving our mission statement, and uh, we will be following our vision uh, every day when we uh, show up at work. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, once again, the outline of the organi organizational structure of the Pembroke Fire Department. Uh, do I have to remind Council that you guys are at the top? Um, so uh, with our full-time staff, we average almost 17 years of experience, and our volunteers uh, average almost nine years of experience. And of course, uh, that nine years of experience is quite low because of the new members we did take on in 2022, which I will speak of shortly. Next slide, please. So uh, 2022 saw the return of uh, service awards, and uh, these were handed out at the Christmas luncheon. Uh, Ten staff received service awards for varying years of service. Uh, primarily, I'll, I'll name the firefighters, Daryl Andrews, Ed Beaupre, Ian Cahey, Chance Calhoun, Jason Kelly, Gary Lowe, Sean Morgan, Brent Verdeel, and Kyle Zimmerman. Next slide. Uh, 2022, we welcomed our first full-time administrative assistant, Wendy Hewitt, into the PFD family on February 28th. Wendy has an extensive and varied background and her positive attitude and dedication was exactly what the department needed in early 2022. Staff changes, uh, there have been, it was relatively quiet uh, with, in 2022 as no major promotions occurred, but uh, firefighter Emma Gibbon and firefighter Brad Lapierre completed their uh, promotional testing and uh, were promoted to second class firefighters. And of course, uh, six new firefighters were hired in September, and uh, the gold end goal 
um, as they began their orientation training uh, was for uh, to have them ready to respond to emergencies in January of 2023. So uh, I will say that unfortunately two of the uh, six uh, moved on uh, mid-orientation, but the four, four of them that stuck it out, they are responding to emergencies now. Uh, this next slide is a breakdown of the incident types that we responded to uh, in 2022. Uh, we responded to 352 incidents. The average response time is 4 minutes and 53 seconds within the city. Our rescue calls are the highest. Um, in that rescue column is also uh, motor vehicle collisions, including extrication. So you'll see the number uh, uh, in a few slides later for that. Uh, false fire calls, um, those like... Those are reviewed according to the bylaw to see whether they pertain to the, uh, the false alarm bylaw and the, uh, and the subsequent uh, uh, fines. So those are reviewed. And uh, then the breakdown of the rest of the responses. The other responses is a pretty uh, wide, uh, wide category that is sort of a catch-all. And uh, the property fires, uh, there was 23 of them uh, uh, this in 2022. Uh, this is just a breakdown of the, um, of the districts we've set up for the city that allows us to uh, maybe uh, try to identify some of, the, um, um, some of our goals for fire prevention and public education activities. And then it also tracks our responses as well to those districts. The next slide is a breakdown of the responses for those districts. So as you can see, uh, District 5 is our busiest and that is our uh, geographically largest and uh, probably uh, highest densely populated uh, as far as residential homes. Um, the one section I'd like to point out is District 1, which has just, uh, just below 20% of our calls. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see this is the dollar loss per district. Uh, down in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see District 1 is 0.2% of our uh, of our total dollar loss for 2022. So although it makes up uh, the, the second highest uh, response calls, our, I think our prevention and education activities are, uh, are working uh, quite well in the downtown core. So there is some, a little bit of work to do for District 5, uh, which, is, uh, which is on the radar. However, um, next slide please. Uh, 2022 did see uh, an increase of uh, more incidents with uh, large uh, dollar value losses as opposed to previous years. So uh, we lost in 2022 a little under $1.7 million worth of property. Uh, but however, our efforts did, did save approximately uh, $2.9 million. So uh, the breakdown is roughly 64% versus uh, 36%. So the next few slides are just going to uh, highlight some of the uh, major responses. So um, unfortunately, these, these major uh, incidents were all uh, residential uh, single-family dwellings. But not unfortunately was that there was no major uh, apartment buildings. Uh, the downtown core wasn't affected and no major industrial loss uh, for 2022. Um, the Bronx Street Fire on April 7th. Uh, everybody was called in for that one. Uh, occupants were uh, evacuated after being uh, alerted by the neighbors, and this particular fire started on the exterior of the structure. And uh, due to the conditions, which it was extremely windy that day, um, the fire was uh, forced into the uh, building on the second floor and up into the roof. Uh, McAllister Street on May 14th. Uh, this was another exterior fire. Uh, damage uh, into the roof structure. Uh, the house was full of smoke. Um, both of this family's uh, dogs perished in the fire as well as their, uh, as their cat. Dunlop Street, May 21st. Um, the occupants were not home at the time of this fire. Um, this was, uh, if um, you recall, this particular day there was a uh, long, long prolonged power outage within the city. Um, the residents were uh, back and forth between a uh, campground and their home. Uh, Center Street, June 7th. 
Um, the flames uh, went from the garage and spread quickly through the roof structure. Um, this one definitely can be attributed to, uh, to maybe um, some building uh, construction habits maybe that weren't, uh, weren't um, proper that allowed for the fire to transition from the garage into the roof of the home. Unfortunately, the family of seven were displaced, but um, the one, uh, the father was treated for smoke inhalation, but uh, really shortly after, so no, uh, no, nobody was severely injured. And last uh, but not least, the McGee Street uh, fire on December 4th. Uh, the occupant, once again, was not home at this time, and the fire uh, did extend into the attic and the roof. Um, this one was... Uh, noticed by a uh, person passing by. Um, nobody was in the home at the time of the fire. Uh, vehicle collisions, fires and extrications. So uh, we responded to 51 vehicle collisions in 2022. So that's uh, 51 of the uh, 101 rescue calls that we had. Of those 51 vehicle collisions, uh, we responded to five extrication incidents. Uh, one incident was within the city limits and the other four extrication calls were in Laurentian Valley. Uh, we responded to three water rescue incidents in 2022. Uh, now inspections and consultations. Uh, you can see that our primary focus in 2022 uh, was on uh, residential at 660. Assembly and uh, the health care uh, were quite high as well. And of course, we only have a few hotels and motels, so you know perhaps that number should go down a little bit in 2023. But the total was uh, 1,563 inspections and consultations for 2022. Our public education activities are increasing nicely as opposed to the last few years. Um, 24 events were held, uh, like training events were held, and you can see the uh, the list of occupants or the number of uh, students that we had. So the goal of our prevention and education programs are to address the uh, risks that I've outlined in the annual report. I think the top five risks are the answer to why we focus so much on the uh, larger apartment buildings in the city. Uh, this approach gives us uh, our biggest bang for our buck. Um, first of all, when we're in the apartment buildings, we're addressing the smoke alarm program, uh, which addresses the uh, malfunctioning and disabled smoke alarms, which was identified as our number one risk. Um, second to that, the inspection program ensures the building will react to the fire the way it's intended uh, within, the building, uh, within the building code and the fire code and in containing smoke and flames. So that addresses the second risk, compliance of fire code and multi-unit apartments. And then uh, while they were in there as part of the inspection, uh, fire safety plans are addressed uh, with the occupants and with the owners. This ensures that everyone knows exactly what to do during a fire, uh, how to escape, and what their roles and responsibilities are whenever there is an emergency. Um, you know, whether that's just uh, um, perhaps attempting to uh, put the fire out or um, um, leading evacuation efforts. So the importance of positive public relations cannot be understated. Um, these are a few of the examples of uh, some of the activities we engaged in in 2022. Uh, the ice water challenge was, uh, was interesting. I would rather do the polar bear dip than do what I did in uh, January of last year. Uh, where Sparky sprayed me with the fire hose, that was, that was horrible. I didn't think I was going to make it. Um, the Junior Firefighter Program is, uh, is um, a successful partnership with the library. Uh, McHappy Day is uh, certainly a, a, fu a fun, interesting day, I will say that. Uh, the fun nights are always a good way to, uh, to get out and uh, spend some time with local families and children. And of course, uh, the Community Expo and the Multicultural Festival are a couple of things that, uh, you know, we look forward to. So Fire Prevention Week this year, due to the timing, uh, we kicked off Fire Prevention Week with our open house. Um, this year, we, uh, we decided that we would partner with Perry Ray Bowl. Uh, and associates, uh, and uh, this year proved to be successful. 
Uh, Perry Ray was chosen as one of the uh, Canadian um, um, branches who would get a uh, fire prevention package. Um, so um, with that, um, she certainly assisted the uh, fire department in providing a lot of our fire prevention uh, and educational materials for the children during that open house. So it was a real pl pleasure to work with, uh, with Perry Ray and uh, hoping to continue uh, this working relationship in the future. So the theme of Fire Prevention Week was Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape. And it was October 9th to the 15th. So we conducted our uh, usual Wear Sparky contest, photo contest, where uh, people uh, need to identify Sparky. Um, and generally we take his picture somewhere in the city and, and people have to identify that spot. And it's generally Sparky who decides the, uh, the uh, location of the photo. So sometimes he makes it uh, way too hard. So I have to like pull him back in a little bit. Um, we expanded the information booths this year to include Giant Tiger because we had the West End and we had the East End covered. So I thought maybe having something in the uh, in central uh, of the city would be a good idea. You know, the Lumber King game is always a hit and uh, you know, we're about well received there. Um, and the, uh, the um, firefighter for a day contest in the schools uh, prior to fire prevention week is, is always fantastic. And uh, I'd like to thank all the schools and the teachers that assist us with that. So our social media, we continued that uh, again in 2022. And we use these platforms to educate not only on fire prevention, uh, but like I said, the first full year as a community emergency management coordinator, we are also uh, incorporating a lot of emergency management and preparedness into these, uh, onto these sites. Our efforts uh, early in 2022 led to a nice partnership with Your TV, who uh, came to the hall a couple of times and professionally developed some of our public service announcements and uh, shared them on their uh, platform and allowed us to share them on ours as well. I'd really like to thank your TV for, uh, for stepping up and doing that. It's been, uh, it's been fantastic working with them. So some of our other things that we focused on uh, was emergency preparedness week. We certainly hit uh, Facebook and Twitter quite hard that week. And uh, my FM stepped in and, and helped us out with that as our, not my FM, but your TV stepped in and helped us out with that too. Uh, the 12 days of holiday fire and CO safety campaign, that's with my FM. And of course there was the uh, cause for alarm, which uh, campaign from the fire marshal's office, which didn't get, uh, didn't get much light of day in September, but uh, it was a, a promotion released by the fire marshal's office in September as they were trying to come up with ways to deal with the number of uh, fire deaths in the province in 2022. So at the end of 2022, the province has lost, uh, lost 133 lives to fire. Um, so this cause for alarm video, according to the fire marshal's words, is a gut-wrenching video, hard-hitting message of the importance of uh, working smoke alarms. So I do know this video is difficult to view. The message is very real. A working smoke alarm saved lives. So the 133 fire uh, deaths lost to fire this year is the worst in two decades in the province. So in the spring, as far as training goes, in the spring, uh, platoons uh, did their uh, annual extrication training. So in this, we have a nice working partnership with ABC um, Scrap Metal and uh, they provide us with some vehicles in the spring and then the rest of the year they open up their, um, their, um, their lot to allow us to come in and, and uh, do whatever training we wish on, uh, on some of their automobiles that they have there. Uh, we did a actual large scale uh, water training event in May and uh, feedback from staff was uh, fantastic. So that's something we will be looking uh, towards continuing, perhaps not using the marina as our location, you know, exploring other options where staff can, uh, you know, experience uh, some different things. Uh, this is a list of some of the NFPA courses uh, that our staff uh, attended in 2022. 
So this uh, slide is our equipment replacement schedule. And this is uh, going to be revisited in 2023. Um, in my introduction, I discussed the rising costs and hence 2023, we will be revisiting this schedule to ensure if this is even feasible. So uh, I do have uh, plans in place to, dis to meet with the treasurer in April and come up with a, uh, an updated plan. Uh, 30, this, uh, sorry, this slide is the overall operating costs for our, uh, our fleet. Um, our total uh, diesel fuel costs are listed at the top. Gasoline costs are listed underneath. So gasoline would include the uh, 2020 Dodge Ram, the 2008 rescue boat, along with uh, any other uh, gasoline powered uh, small engines that we carry for emergency response purposes. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, sorry Steve, um, with this one, I believe that um, you know we do have a full-time licensed mechanic, well not full-time, he's a full-time firefighter, but also a licensed mechanic on staff. And uh, I can't, uh, I have to uh, commend him on his efforts and his, uh, his diligence when dealing with these vehicles. He has a very strict um, prevention maintenance plan for these apparatus. And I think without his efforts, these costs would be, uh, would be tremendous. So the next, a lot of slides are going to focus on on what your firefighting staff give back to the community. Um, so this year, the Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association turns 86. Um, they were founded in 1936. Um, so as we go through the slides, um, Steve, next slide please. So some of the events, you'll see that the Muscular Dystrophy Canada, that's the 58th year that they've supported this organization. Of course, uh, the biggest event of the year is the annual Chili Fest, where they, uh, where they uh, bring in a lot of the funds that get dispersed to some of these organizations. Also too, just recently, um, they hold and run the annual Elwyn Ducro Memorial Hockey Tournament, which also all proceeds then get distributed back to the community. So once again, some more, uh, uh, can keep going, Steve. Okay. So one of these years, I'm going to try to get out of the Movember campaign, but. <laughs> so uh, the last thing I'll mention about the uh, Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association is um, they're also a major sponsor of the open house event. So without their assistance, um, there's no way that the fire prevention activities would be as successful as they are. So I would really like to, uh, to commend their efforts and say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart. So new and exciting, in uh, late March, we finally got our SCBAs that we purchased in 2021. Uh, we put those into, uh, into service uh, immediately and if you recall the significant, uh, sig significant events or incidents, uh, they went to work immediately. Um, the staff uh, trained diligently on those new, uh, those new um, packs before they were put in service so that the transition was uh, seamless. And uh, I I'm glad it did because, you know, with the number of fires we had in April and May, if uh, they didn't train uh, as hard as they did, you know, we could have had some, um, some uneventful uh, uh, or unfortunate injuries. And then last, uh, we'll end with uh, the slogans for the, uh, for the half ton. And these are the winners of the Firefighter for a Day contest. And uh, they, uh, their winning slogans are picked. They get their fire, or uh, they get their picture taken with their slogans. And then they did come to the fire hall in November and spent uh, an afternoon with the firefighters. Uh, learning what it uh, means to be a firefighter, training, and, uh, and getting to know some of the equipment. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Steve Sell, for the dedication and professionalism of you and your, your staff and the, uh, 
Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association Local 488 and all the different community. It's truly appreciated. Any comments or questions for the Chief on his annual report? Yes, Councillor Keel. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, obviously, this is the first time I'm getting the annual report uh, that isn't in a way of, of me preparing to come to Council. And I think uh, what strikes me most is not just, it's not just the fires, it's the amount of community work that you and your firefighters do. And I know, because uh, despite trying not to, I go on Facebook constantly, I know the notices came out about the new taxes, and we know the fire department is, is a big, it's a, it's a big part of our taxes. But when you tell me that response time averages four minutes and 53 seconds, that you save 63% of property versus 36 lost, we have a gold standard of a fire department here. And you are to thank for that, the firefighters are to thank for that, and the people of the city of Pembroke are lucky to have that kind of service with that kind of speed, because you don't get that everywhere. And I realize in some of the more rural communities, you, you probably couldn't get that even if you wanted it. Um, but the people of Pembroke are very lucky. And, uh, and I certainly would love to see uh, um, your report shared around. I don't know uh, if the CAO can, can see that we can link it on our City of Pembroke stuff, but I think if the people were to look at that, they would feel so proud um, of what we have here in the City of Pembroke. Um, that report was just amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, I do believe that it will be, uh, will be accessible uh, through the website. And if anybody would like an actual paper copy, they can just reach out to me at the fire hall. I'd be happy to provide it for them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Frenier. I just want to say thank you very much. And um, sorry, through the chair. Um, you wouldn't know that you've only, you're only in your second year. So you seem to be fitting in really comfortably. Um, you seem to be very passionate about the work you're doing. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor, and thank you to you, uh, Councillor Keel, as well. Um, what I would like to say is that uh, I appreciate that, um, but there have been people that have come before me who have prepared the way, and I'd really like to acknowledge that, and I'd really like to acknowledge um, um, the, the effort that the staff do put in. Like, it is a tremendous effort, and, uh, and um, not to sound like a dud, but we do take it seriously. Um, we know what's expected of us, and, and uh, uh, we know what we know when people call for help. They they require help immediately, so uh, we do take that very seriously. But uh, thank you very much for recognizing that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plummer. Just again to commend uh, yourself and your staff on an excellent job and also an excellent report that uh, really kind of summarizes everything that you do and uh, your fellow st uh, staff members, firefighters. <clears throat> it's uh, quite a uh, exceptional service we have here in Pembroke. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chief. And remember, when you're cooking, keep looking. <laughs> thank you, Chief. Yes, please remember that. Next on the under new business, item E, bylaw 2023-19, civil marriage solemnization services, Ms. Martin. In July of uh, 2020, council directed that civil marriage solemnization services be implemented in the city of Pembroke and designated Terry Lapier, our former CAO and deputy clerk, um, as the uh, officiant. And Mr. Lapierre then further designated the, the clerk to solemnize marriages um, in the city. Um, un unfortunately, shortly after council direction was received, COVID um, prevented the service from being initiated. So since April of 2022, when we began to provide this service, um, we've been offering um, services to couples wishing to get married couple um, arrange um, and book their officiant through our, our treasury staff who process payments, book the ceremony, and then send a notice to the officiant. The officiant then meets with the couple um, to um, um, discuss their ceremony details. And uh, following the ceremony, then the officiant 
officiant registers the uh, the wedding through um, our paperwork here at the city, as well as uh, sending paperwork, the marriage license, et cetera, to the office of the Registrar General. So with the retirement of the former CAO deputy clerk, a new appointment bylaw regarding uh, civil marriage solemnization for the city of Pembroke is required. And for your information, um, in 2022, we performed 23 marriages, which uh, resulted in an income of uh, $6,526.55 for the city. And to date, um, we've performed in 2023 um, two civil marriages, and we have 12 scheduled within the next few weeks. So um, we're asking that uh, committee uh, maintain the civil marriage solemnization for the city as it has been successful and appreciated by uh, our, the people using the service and that council authorize an appointment bylaw regarding um, the service uh, for the city. And a bylaw has been prepared and will be before council this evening. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Councillor Keel? Um, hopefully a quick question. Um, so obviously we're, we're doing this because Mr. Lapier retired. I wonder, do we need to specifically name a person in our bylaw or can we name a title that uh, obviously we would fill and refill as necessary? Just, just to, I guess, try and flow through any of those transitions. So through the chair, uh, the province does require names. And I do have to forward then a copy of the certified uh, bylaw uh, to the province so they have that on record. Um, so the bylaw that's before council this evening names myself as the clerk, and I further designate um, a, or are requesting a designation of a treasury staff so that there are two individuals uh, available to, uh, to perform the civil solemnization ceremonies. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lafreniere? Thank you. Through the chair, um, I certainly think it's a wonderful service we're providing. Um, but if I could ask um, Ms. Martin, how many hours of staff time would go into preparing uh, for this event right up until the ceremony itself, like including the ceremony? How many hours would that take? Each ceremony, I wouldn't say, would take an hour. Um, we and that's from the initial uh, time they come in to um, uh, request the license if that is required or some uh, couples do come in with a license from another municipality um, but setting up the appointments and then the actual service because it's a civil uh, service it's 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 short um, couples have uh, the city has prepared six scripts that they can choose from and so some are very very short and some are a little longer maybe 10 15 minutes for the actual ceremony um, but I'd say the whole process wouldn't take any longer than an hour, even with me meeting with them to discuss their, their actual ceremony. Okay, I was just making sure that it was, you know, a fiscally responsible thing for us to be doing, and it sounds like it is. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Councillor uh, Jackano. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, through you to Ms. Uh, Martin. Where does the actual ceremony take place in the building? And... Uh, are there a number of people restricted to attend? I'm, I'm just curious. I, I just don't know how it works. I'm just curious. So through the chair, uh, currently in the building in City Hall, we offer council chambers. Um, and we also have um, the former apartment up on the next level. Um, it, unfortunately, that apartment isn't accessible, so that limits um, who can attend and, and use that room. But we use the former, what, it's an apartment upstairs, so the former living uh, room area, and we have a wedding arch up there and that sort of thing. So couples have decided pretty much 50-50, um, you know, as far as which, uh, which room they prefer. We have done, uh, and we have offered, um, based on, on time, um, uh, in the summertime a, uh, through the park, and so we did do one at Pansy Patch Park as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Martin. Any further comments or questions? No. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, item F, half masting on, on raising of flags policy. Ms. Martin. So in June uh, of 2022, Council approved a half masking and raising uh, flags policy for the city to ensure that all flags at city facilities and events are flown and displayed in an appropriate and consistent manner. The policy outlines the circumstances under which the city um, will fly its flags at half mast, sets out procedure to recognize the, a visit by a dignitary and addresses the flying of community flags. 
With the recent death of Her Majesty Queen uh, Elizabeth II, the policy became out of date and requires admit, uh, revision. So a revised City of um, Pembroke Half Masking and Raising of Flags policy is being provided at this time for discussion at the committee level and direction in order that a finalized version can be brought to Council for fu future adoption. Thank you. Discussion, comments, questions? Councillor Keel. Uh, very well written policy. Um, uh, obviously, I guess with, when the last uh, when the last one was passed, I guess it specifically it specifically named Her Majesty, and, and this one replaces that with um, with the sovereign. So that uh, that certainly would make it uh, um, uh, tr more transitional. Um, the only uh, the only thing, and, and I I missed this when I was looking through the package before, uh, the sovereign and members of the royal family. Um, I guess the the federal protocol, um, the federal protocol recognizes the the heir and the heir to the throne, and I believe the provincial policy has has followed suit on that one. Um, when you say members of the royal family, that uh, without a definition could get rather large. Um, so I might uh, I might suggest that we just maybe match the f the federal one uh, just to just to rein that one in a little bit, but uh, um, I'm sounding like a flag etiquette and protocol guru, and and uh, for some reason it is one of my hobbies that I I wish I wasn't letting out now. But uh, other than that, uh, the, it looks like a great policy, and and Ms. Martin, thank you uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Moving along, item G, bylaw enforcement officer appointment, Mr. Unra. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, uh, due to uh, staff attrition at operations, uh, the current bylaw appointing municipal requires revisions. Uh, so, the new bylaw that uh, will be uh, before you this evening. Uh, will appoint the um, uh, new Supervisor of Roads and Fleet, which uh, started this Monday, Adrian Tomasini. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Plummer. Those in favour, Finance and Amendment Committee meeting is adjourned. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the uh, striking committee for March 7, 2023. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest in respect to this agenda? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion for the approval of this agenda. It's moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Plummer. Those in favour? That's carried. Uh, next item is the minutes, February 7, 2023. Entertain a motion for their I have Councillor Keel seconded by Councillor Plummer. Those in favour? That's carried. 
Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none. New business, uh, Mr. Unruh, 6A, Pembroke Waterfront Advisory Committee. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the recommendation is that we a committee rejection is requested regarding the membership of the Pembroke Waterfront Advisory Committee as follows, that there would be uh, one citizen appointment, uh, two City of Pembroke councillors, one from the Qantas Club of Pembroke, uh, one from the Pembroke Horticultural Society, and one from McGonkin College. So the nominations have been received with the following individuals for the newly established Pembroke Waterfront Advisory Committee. Uh, citizen appointment, uh, Fred Blackstein. Uh, City of Pembroke councillors, Councillor uh, Ian Keel and the Deputy Mayor Brian Abella. Uh, Qantas Club of Pembroke member, Jay McLaren. Uh, Pembroke Horticultural Society member, Kathy Hoogley. And the Agonka College staff member, Adam Johns, if there was any questions. Thank you, and I realize it's coming before council, but perhaps there's a, a motion so that we can move forward with this one to the council. Or not. Councilor, moved by Councillor Keel, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Those in favor, that's carried. Okay. Um, Mr. Unruh, the next one is ad hoc uh, citizen committee regarding council remuneration. Yes, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee direction is requested regarding the appointment of four individuals to the Pembroke Ad Hoc Citizens Committee of Council Renewation Review and the appointment of the Chief Administration Officer as a resource person. Uh, so nominations have been received from the following individuals for the newly established Pembroke Ad Hoc Citizens Committee of Council Renumerations Review. So uh, Michael LeMay, Bob Schrader, Dan Callahan, and Marcel, Marcel Mantha. Thank you, Mr. Unruh, and again, I know it's before council, but perhaps there's a motion moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor of that, thank you. Um, next item, closed session. A meeting was held earlier this evening to discuss the following personal matters about identifiable individuals, including municipal or local board employees who have been recommended for two council advisory committees, section 239 sub 2 of the Municipal Act. Uh, there was no pecuniary interest declared. Reports concerning the individuals recommended for the appointment to the two council advisory committees uh, was discussed during the, uh, during the meeting. Uh, and I entertain a motion for the adjournment of the striking committee. I have moved by the uh, Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Jack, and all those in favour, and that was carried. We are adjourned from the striking committee. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order for March 7, 2023 of Council. I'd ask that everyone please take a moment. Please stand for a moment of opening prayer or reflection. Before opening this meeting of Council, I would ask that those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest in respect to the items this evening? Seeing none. Uh, in respect to minutes, I'd uh, entertain a uh, motion for the approval of minutes of council, regular meeting of council February 21st, 2023. Moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? That's carried. Next, we have adoption of minutes of committees. First, we have Planning and Development Committee, which was February 7th, 2023. I move by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? That's carried. Next is Finance and Admin Committee, February 7th, 2023. Moved by uh, Councillor Jackano, uh, seconded by Councillor Lafreni. Those in favor? That's carried. Next, we have Striking Committee. Uh, February 7th, 2023, moved by Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Plummer. Those in favor? That's carried. Next, we're into receiving minutes from local boards. First up is the Pembroke Public Library Board, January 17th, 2023, moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. Those in favor? That was carried. Next is the Ottawa Valley Waste Recovery Center, October 27th, 2022. Moved by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Keel. Those in favor? That's carried. Next up, we have under committee reports. The first item is the 2022 remuneration reports. It's for information purposes only, required underneath the Municipal Act Section 284. It was circulated in your, in your packages. So that's that item. Next, we have under committee reports, striking committee appointment of members to the Pembroke Waterfront Committee. I have Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship. Your striking committee of Council Vegas report recommends the following meeting this evening, uh, uh, this evening as follows. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Jackano, that the fo following five individuals be appointed to the Pembroke Waterfront Advisory Committee. Uh, Citizen Appointment, Fred Blackstein. City of Council Appointment, uh, Councillor Ian Kuehl, and the Deputy Mayor. Kiwanis Club uh, Pembroke member, uh, Jay McLaren. Pembroke Horticultural Society, Kathy Hughley. And Algonquin College staff member, Adam Jones. And the staff resource person for the Assist the City Parks and Recreation Department. You. Your striking committee of council begs to report and recommend from its meeting held this evening. Moved by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Jackano, that the following five individuals being appointed to the Pembroke Waterfront Advisory Committee uh, Fred Blackstein as the citizen appointment, Councillor Ian Keel, and the Deputy Mayor Brian Abdallah as the uh, city council representation. Uh, Jay McLaren as the Qantas Club of Pembroke member, Kathy Hughley as the Pembroke Horticultural Society member, and Adam Johns as the Algonquin College staff member, and that the staff resource person being assigned is the City Parks and Recreation Department. Call the question in respect to that matter. Those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Uh, next is appointment of members to the Pembroke Ad Hoc Citizen Committee, I have Councillor Lafreniere. Your striking committee of council begs to report and recommend from its meeting held this evening as follows. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ian Keel, that the following four citizens be appointed to the Pembroke Ad Hoc Citizens Committee of Council Remuneration Review. Michael LeMay, Bob Schrader, Dan Callahan, and Marcel Mantha. And that the Chief Administrative Officer be appointed as a resource person to the committee.
The Shrinking Committee of Council begs to report and recommend from a meeting held earlier this evening, moved by Council Lafreni, a second by Council Keel, that the following four individuals being appointed to the ad hoc Citizens Committee for Council Remuneration, being Michael LeMay, Bob Schrader, Dan Callahan, Marcel Mantha, and the CAO be appointed as the resource person to that particular committee. Uh, those in favor? That's carried. Everyone, as March 8th is International Women's Day, it is fitting that by the power vested in me to declare March 20, the month of March 2023, to be Women's History Month in the city of Pembroke. Whereas Women's History Month is an annual proclaimed month that highlights the contributions of women in history and contemporary society. And whereas throughout history, women of every race, class, and ethnic background have made historic contributions and have strived and sacrificed for equity and equality despite hardship, exclusion, and discrimination. And whereas this month celebrates the achievement of women have made over the course of history and honors those women and girls who have paved the way to help realize a more equal and inclusive society, who have helped build our nation, shaped our progress, and strengthened our character as a people. Therefore, be it resolved, I, Ron Jerva, Mayor of the City of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2023 as Women History Month in the City of Pembroke. Next, we have bylaws 2023 19 Civil Marriage Solemnization Appointments. Council Lafreniere. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ian Keel. The bylaw 2023 19, a bylaw to authorize the civil marriage solemnization service in the City of Pembroke, be adopted and passed. And further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Lafreniere, seconded by Councillor Keel. The bylaw 2023 19, a bylaw to authorize the civil marriage solemnization service in the city of Pembroke, be adopted and passed. And further, that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Councillor Lafreniere, did you wish to speak to it or? It's up to you. <laughs> Well, basically, we've been performing uh, marriages at City Hall, and it was a little slowed down during COVID. But this is basically just authorizing us to continue um, uh, for our deputy <laughs> to continue to, have, to offer those services to our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if there's no discussion, I'll call the question. Those in favor? And that's carried. Great. Thank you. Next, we have 2023-21, appointment of bylaw enforcement officers. I have Councillor Keel. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Giacono, that bylaw 2023-21, a bylaw to appoint municipal bylaw enforcement officers for the City of Pembroke, be adopted and passed. And further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. Well, by Councillor Keel, second by Councillor Jack, know that bylaw 2023 21, a bylaw to appoint municipal bylaw enforcement officers for the City of Pembroke, be adopted and passed. And further, the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Keel, did you wish to? Uh, this bylaw simply uh, is a housekeeping bylaw. Uh, obviously, we had the departure of the prior uh, road supervisor and the hiring of a new road supervisor. Uh, so this just appoints the new road supervisor as a bylaw enforcement officer. Thank you. Call the question. Those in favor? That's carried. Uh, motions this evening. We have resolution 2023-005, Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. Moved by myself, seconded by Andrew, uh, Councillor Andrew Plummer. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from Ivan Gunter at 157 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan. Am I on the right one here? Yes. Uh, excuse me. 
the applicant must comply with grant guidelines of the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, Accessibility Grant, and Planning and Building Permit Fee Grant, and will have 18 months to complete all work and submit receipts in order to receive the grant. The grant total awarded to this applicant is in the amount of $8,742.00, waiting your signature, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Jack and a second by Councillor Plummer. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from Ivan Gunther uh, at 157 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan. Uh, the applicant uh, needing to comply with grant <coughs> guidelines of the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, Accessibility Grant, and Planning and Building Permit Fee Grant, having 18 months to complete the work and submit receipts in order to receive the grant, totaling 8,742. Call the question, those in favor? That's carried. Councillor Jackano, I understand you have a second one, 2023-006. Thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Plummer. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the amendment to the approved community improvement plan grant for 201 Pembroke Street West. The amendment uh, removes the building permit fee grant of $1,482 from the total grant and awaiting your signature. Moved by Councillor Jack and a second by Councillor Plummer, be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the amendment to the approved Community Improvement Plan Grant for 201 Pembroke Street West, the amendment removing the building P, building, P, building permit fee grant of $1,482 from the total grant. Call the question, those in favor? And that's carried. Next, we have the motion to reinstate Senior Advisory Committee, Deputy Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Ed Jagano, that Council reinstate the Pembroke Seniors Advisory Committee as per its previous membership structure and terms of reference. Thank you. So I was thinking about what, what to say at this table tonight, and, you know, I was pondering saying this, saying that, and to start off with, I don't know why we're here. I don't know why we're debating this, this motion to a proven concept. Why are we having to do this? When we had a proven committee before, a proven Seniors Advisory Committee that did wonderful things, Councillor Frenier sat on it, as did former Mayor Lake Mike LeMay, and during the 2018 election, when it was going door to door, I heard, where's the voice for the seniors? Where's the voice for the seniors? So Mayor LeMay and Councillor Frenier supported uh, the Seniors Advisory Committee. We all, all the council supported it. So we had a formation of a Seniors Advisory Committee. And if you look at the mandate of the committee, to be a communication vehicle responding to the quality of life for all seniors in the city of Pembroke, to provide a forum for consumers and deliverers of senior services and facilities, to identify issues and explore possible remedies and work to implement them. The committee will also encourage the development of a seniors volunteer program and respond to issues council through its Parks and Rec Committee referred to by t from time to time. So the composition of the committee represented all of the seniors. It did not just represent the 50 plus living center. We had a member from that committee on the Seniors Advisory Committee. We had a member from the Francophone community, ACFO Champlain, they were on the committee. We had members that lived in their homes that were on the committee. We had member also uh, from the uh, Holly McDonald, manager of Charbel Heritage Place Center. She was on the committee representing all the retirement homes. And we accomplished quite a bit, a lot, despite COVID. We didn't meet every month. We met every second month and less during the COVID. And the Parks and Recreation Director would come. He would take minutes. He would send out the agenda a few weeks before, and it was very effective because we had representatives from all the seniors community, not just one. We had communication, we had collaboration, there was no duplication of services, 
And what we accomplished was major despite having COVID. We started off with the needs survey that we distributed all through the community. And, and guess what? The number one challenge that the community of seniors told us was transportation. That was the number one challenge. And we took the needs survey and I, I chaired the subcommittee and we came up with parameters to create a request for proposal for an age-friendly community plan. Now, if anyone does not know what an age-friendly community plan is, this is a 10 to 15 year roadmap of um, what facilities and programs we have in the community and services, what we have and what we need to keep seniors active, to promote active living for seniors, keep them healthy, keep them in their homes. And we talk about affordable housing and we want to keep seniors in their homes. We talked about that tonight with tax deferral. So this is one of the goals of Age Friendly Community Plan. And Council adopted the Age Friendly Community Plan. We're spending $35,000. It's going to come out later on in the year because first we have to do our active living master plan. And the first committee that the tender, which was written up by Todd Francis, former Parks and Rec director, right here, the first committee that the uh, consultant is supposed to meet with is the Seniors Advisory Committee because we set up the parameters right here and we recommended to him and Councillor Frenny and I approved the RFP. Now that was the first committee he was supposed to meet with plus all the community stakeholders. And then after it was approved and all the recommendations come forward, the Seniors Advisory Committee was the vehicle to make sure that all the recommendations got implemented and to provide feedback to council. Now we have no seniors advisory committee. Now some people have suggested to me, well, we can, they can just meet uh, in a boardroom, they can elect a chair and a vice chair, and they can send their minutes to council if they want. And they can come to council periodically and present. Or the drop-in center can do that. Well, that's not, that's not what they want. I've received tons of calls from members of the community seniors community and community at large and they said to me what is going on at city council who do you represent do not step backwards step forward and support the seniors advisory committee they want a direct line to city hall and as far as staff resources being used i think they deserve it they deserve they these residents built this community and if we want to attract new people to pembroke to have our economy grow and our tax base grow we need a seniors advisory committee you look at any, you Google Seniors Advisory Committee in Canada and Ontario. There are many, many Seniors Advisory Committees set up like we had. And then I get a text this morning from someone, a former member of our Seniors Advisory Committee. He, he hears ads on the radio. Guess who's setting up a Seniors Advisory Committee? Our friends in Lurchin Valley. So do they know something that we don't? And all these other communities that have a Seniors Advisory Committee, they know something we don't, or we know something they don't. So either they're moving forward or we're not. We're moving backward. So one of the goals of the age friendly Community Plan is to keep people in their home. They have, to, they have recommendations and guidelines by the World Health Organization, and it's a very serious plan. Iron Prior did one. Petawawa did one. So the, um, I made a note here about the drop-in, the 50-plus active living centre. The Seniors Advisory Committee does not duplicate services. The 50-plus active living centre is, is not an umbrella committee for all seniors in the community. The centre is involved in recreational, leisure, educational programs through a paid membership and would exclude seniors looking for a voice outside of the centre. Therefore, it, it is not inclusive of all seniors living in the city. This is why we had a member from Francophone, retirement homes and people living in their home. I got an email from uh, one resident a couple weeks ago and I phoned her and she said, I find it sad that the elderly are again put on the back burner. So if you want to build a community for everyone, you have to engage seniors, family, youth via advisory committee. There's a book here that I read when I was uh, entering politics a few years ago, 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. It's a very well-written book. I know some of you have read it. And one, one paragraph is on seniors. And it says, if you want to kill your community, don't get the seniors involved. 
because they have wealth, they have knowledge, they have, they have uh, time on their hands, and you want to make them active, don't get them involved, okay? Don't engage them. And by not having an advisory committee representing everyone with a direct contact to City Hall, that's not a good move. So it's uh, imperative that we reinstate the Seniors Advisory Committee with what we had. And Councillor Lafrenia, you were on the committee. You know the effectiveness of it all. Uh, we did a lot of good things. We, we instigated the concert series featuring Louis Schreier, seven or eight concerts in, in two days at the retirement homes. We've done it three times, very well received. And this is the least the seniors deserve in our community. Um, a proven model, and I'm asking you, councillors here, to vote in favour. They, they don't want a watered-down approach. They don't deserve that. You know, get in a room, organise, you can come if you want. That's not, that's not, that's not the way to do this. This is, this is a group of uh, residents who represent 25 to 30 percent of our population who need a voice and they deserve a voice and I could go on and on but I'm not going to it's straightforward um, if we if we do reinstate it I want to sit on the senior advisory committee I think it's imperative that we reinstate it and uh, those are my that's what I have to say so I ask you to move forward and we reinstate the committee thank you Thank you, Deputy Mayor. The seconder was Councillor Jackano. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if I may speak to it, I second it for the purposes of discussion. Uh, I know that uh, Councillor Abdallah is, uh, or Deputy Mayor Abdallah, excuse me, is very passionate about this, and I think we all are. I think some of the issues that may come forward is about cost. People say, "Well, it's only one staff person." And it's, maybe it's over time, but so what? They all deserve it. Yes, they deserve it. But I was talking to a couple of seniors today who don't want to pay the extra in their taxes. And, and as new committees are formed, you got another staff member. Pretty soon it becomes a full-time position. Now you got to pay vacation. You, and I, I don't tell me it doesn't happen because it does. People come out and say, you know what? This is such an important issue now. We're going to create a full-time staff position for it to ensure that it runs properly. And that's happened in the past. The seniors I spoke to today do not want to pay more in their taxes. They do not. One of them was on your committee I spoke to today. And I said to him, well, you know, perhaps, the, perhaps this is a changing format. Perhaps this will be the phoenix that will rise out of the ashes and become even a better thing. Does it have to be directly associated with the Council of the City of Pembroke? And the individual said, no, we, we just want to get together and bring forward our suggestions. So what's wrong with that? I mean, do we want to have a staff person there all the time? So we're going to have another committee with the waterfront. Is that another staff person is going to meet there late in the evenings? Is that an important thing? Well, that's what council has to decide. Uh, personally, I think that this committee should be reborn under some other venue. It should still continue to exist because, as Councillor Dallas said, these are the people with the wealth, the knowledge. They're coming here to our communities from other, other places to retire and live here. Uh, do they want to be taxed more when they're trying to avoid tax coming from another centre? I don't think so. They want us to run a proper operation and still have the input. Thank you. And I saw Councillor Purcell put up your hand, yes? Thank you. Um, I won't stand just because I, I won't be able to see my notes. <laughs> my apologies. Um, here we are again talking about um, committees and, and you know uh, establishing you know additional committees. Uh, we you know we talked about you know appointing members tonight to the Pembroke Waterfront Committee as well as the Pembroke Ad Hoc Citizens Committee for for Council renew, re, Renumeration. Um, and here, you know, we had a diversity, equity, inclusion committee um, that um, was really instrumental in terms of moving things forward um, as a diverse uh, organization. Um, and, you know, 
why, why the seniors and why not, um, you know, diversity? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, when we talk about diversity, it includes uh, people of age. It includes um, people of different ethnicity, sexual orientation. Um, maybe we need to have a, a more holistic approach in terms of listening to people and listening to various different groups instead of just segregating the various different, you know, social uh, groups and saying, okay, well, whose needs are looked at, you know, in priority? Um, I've heard some of the councillors speak, well, well they're, they vote. They vote in numbers. Is that, is that the reason why we're, we're looking at a, a committee? Um, why can't we look at various different opportunities to have individuals, not only major populations and major, major demographics, but also minorities, have a voice in terms of the direction that they want to see Pembroke. And um, I just think that this is rehashing um, some, some really you know, sore wounds uh, for myself. That's for sure. And I think that this is um, you know, something that uh, I agree. I'd like to see more committees, but uh, if we are sticking to our guns and back to those discussions in terms of December and January, when resources for these committees were you know top priority that's the whole reason why we abolished these committees is because we didn't have enough staff resources and here tonight you appointed two more committees when the request was previously in regards to one of the striking committees was just to look at re remuneration it didn't say anything about striking up a committee anyway that's 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 all i have to say thank you thank you councilor purcell does anyone Else, Councillor Keel. So I, I would, I mean, I'm in agreement with both the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Purcell. Um, it does seem like we're we're relitigating a, a concern, uh, and and it was discussed at great length back in January that we were worried about staffing concerns, um, and the the cost and the the staff time that went into it. Um, at the same time, I think what we need to recognize, and we can talk about, we can talk about seniors as, as, as voters, and we can talk about, you know, we can talk about the politics of what we're talking about. But the one thing that I don't think has been mentioned tonight is whether you were talking about the diversity or inclusion committee, and whether you're talking about the seniors, we're talking about some of the most vulnerable populations in our city. I would not expect seniors that are up there in age that are in a retirement home to suddenly start canvassing the city of Pembroke to try and find other like-minded citizens to put together a committee so I think that there's a role for us to play in bringing parties together so that we get information and that we get direction as a council I think I might be one of the youngest people on this council I'll be honest with you, I don't know everything that a senior is looking for here in the city of Pembroke. And I think that the way that we are treating these vulnerable populations, which is to say, go off and organize yourself, and then come back to us when you've figured it out. That is going backwards. I can only imagine that this council in its last term saw some a semblance of need to bring these people together in order to hear from them and to get direction. Now, I know the deputy mayor made the comment of, of they don't want anything watered down and, and that's, that's, he knows that's the part that I'm struggling with here the most. Um, it was proposed during the last debate on diversity and inclusion as to whether or not we can, we can table this matter and I don't think I fleshed it out then, but I'll flesh it out more now. I feel as though that there are some ways, and the only thing we've talked about in the negative so far is resources. We have a very smart staff. We have a brand new CAO. I feel as though if we task them to say, forget what we have in our current procedural bylaw. Can you put together something new? Is there a new type of advisory committee that applications can come into City Hall that we can appoint members 
from across the spectrum, from across the city, there's not going to be staff resources and, the, and this proposed committee should be aware of that up front. But there's other things that we can help them with. We could help them with having a location, whether it's, whether it's during the day or after hours at the library. We can get them a location to meet. We can get them together. Councillors can sit on it. I appreciate what Councillor Jackano said. This, this was my first time passing a budget, and you better believe I heard about it afterwards. I'm sure we all did. Resources at the city, I think the mayor once told me, were, were described as lean. And we certainly don't want to, um, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in hiring a new staff member that can be the staff representative on 400 committees. So it was, it was briefly suggested in the last one. I'm going to suggest it again. I think it's important for us to hear from our citizens. And during the strategic planning at the community session, we, well, I heard that because I was there in a different role. But us listening to them and communications was important to them. And so I would beg of this council this time around, if we're not going to support outright recreating the seniors committee, I would beg of this council that we put some trust in our staff and see if they can bring back to us some sort of an advisory level committee that we can appoint, that we can recognize officially, since that seems to be what some of them want, um, but that it's not going to have the resources that other committees um, have. Um, so I would, I would put that forward as a motion. I would beg that, worst case scenario is we don't like what the staff comes back with. The best case scenario is the staff brings us back something that we find tolerable and that we can start implementing for groups that want to apply to be officially recognized um, to be advisory committees to the city of Pembroke. Um, that will be my, my plea in this, on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keel. Does anyone else wish to speak to it? Uh, Councillor Plummer? Thank you, Worship. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I'm not in doubt that, you know, people of this community need a voice, and I think it's kind of inaccurate to, to say that without a committee that they can't feel heard. We are elected here in the city. We have email. We have phone. We have other ways meeting on them on the street. I, certainly, I've heard it. Uh, you know, people, if they want to be heard or have a topic they want to talk about, they, they tell you. So to feel that every, every group needs its own committee to just be heard, I think is a little inaccurate. But also, the other part about the seniors, we do have a senior center. They're considered a strategic partner in the city. I think that there certainly is room to uh, engage with them more and maybe change the terms of reference so they come to council uh, on a quarterly basis to report and then give input. Uh, our deputy mayor says that they're not inclusive. I find that hard to believe that a senior center would not be inclusive of its seniors. Uh, point of order. I, I didn't say inclusive. Yes, you did. I said. I, what I said was they have a paid membership, so they're not inclusive of the whole seniors in the community. People that go there at paid membership, that's what I meant. Thank you. Um, so as I said, there was an age-friendly plan being developed on the previous ter uh, council term. So let's move forward with that. And I also do echo that Councillor Keel's uh, points. I don't discredit that, yes, there is staff time that has to be taken. If we start this committee, what happens the next year? Does a youth committee get created? Does a, this committee get created? Does this committee, you know, it goes on and on. Where does it end? And are we hiring then one staff member turns into two because we want all this input from different committees? So is there a way to then, if people do want to start their own group and be recognized, I, I feel that there may be something there. Um, I don't discredit that. I just feel that um, outright today to appoint a senior advisory committee in the same terms of reference, I would not be in support of. Thank you. Did you, Councillor Frenier? I wasn't going to speak tonight on this because I too, as Councillor Purcell uh, mentioned earlier, I think this is rehashing. This is bringing up a lot of emotion 
over the decisions that we, we as a council have made in regards to committees. And I was reluctant to speak tonight because the last time we discussed this, I pretty much got hung out to dry by the public. Um, you know, I think that we have to, my original opinion on all of the committees was to continue them on an ad hoc basis. When we need them, we establish them, much like we did establish tonight an ad hoc committee. And I mentioned this eons ago during this term about that, and I support that. And I like the idea of the city still supporting them with a location for a meeting. I enjoyed being on the Seniors Advisory Committee, and I do believe that we did accomplish something. Um, I don't think that that group of people that I worked side by side with would mind if we said, you're not going to have a staff resource person, but you can use the fire hall for your meetings, that type of thing. Um, I just think they did put a lot into the meetings. They took pride in it. Um, they came from many different organizations that serve seniors. We did have seniors 50 plus representation. We had Holly, as Cal uh, Deputy Mayor said, from uh, one of the retirement homes. We had um, Francophone, past counselor, who is a senior. Um, I, I invite all of the committees that were disbanded to do the same. And I welcome Councillor Keel's comments and maybe staff looking at it a little closer because I certainly am not going to take away from the good that all of those committees that were disbanded have done for our community. And that's all I'm going to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So may I have an opportunity to speak from the chair or do you wish the deputy mayor to take the chair? No, but you're... Okay, thank you. So, fellow members of council, I won't be supporting the motion that as, as it's been put forward. Um, I could go on, but obviously we know, we know we've discussed previously uh, about the, the variety of uh, different committees that didn't move forward. Um, there was the one that would, was consolidated being Keeping Pembroke Beautiful with the uh, uh, climate action and to build upon the synergies between the two. And as a side, I am receiving emails uh, from individuals saying that uh, they're embracing uh, this particular change. And once there was skepticism, but now they appear to be moving forward in that regard. Um, as stated previously, each of the uh, advisory committees, as we touched upon earlier, has uh, What's being envisioned there is uh, by the deputy mayor would uh, to be the way it was before, wherein you have a, a staff member who is assisting with agendas, minutes, facilitating meetings, uh, drafting documents, researching, actioning items, all of those different things because I've sat on an advisory committee before and that's what takes place. As a, uh, on a historical note, and I think it's important for all members of council to either be refreshed or to be advised, Previously, this council used to have nine members of council. We then uh, moved to reduce it to seven members of council, and yet after that decision, created a number of different advisory committees and then expected one or more councillors to sit on these variety of different uh, committees. So it's not just simply um, staffing, uh, which, and you, you have me right, uh, Councillor Keel, when I say lean, because when there was uh, the former mayor wanted to do an analysis of the different uh, committees, uh, and what came back is that we were very lean to the point where uh, we have a uh, individual that we split a third, a third, a third in terms of communications, tourism. Uh, so we have individuals that wear many, many different hats. Um, that's how lean we are and why are we that lean because we're trying to be cognizant of the ratepayers ability to to pay and obviously every time and I'm not I'm not uh, saying anything mean against staff members uh, but when you hire a staff member then there's benefits there's retirement packages there's there's a whole lot of things that come along with hiring a staff member um, what I want to convey because uh, seemingly uh, as one was pointed out to me when I had coffee with one individual is that perhaps um, I'm not communicating the best with the uh, public so what I'm going to say and I, I typed it out to make sure that I'm conveying this so that everyone uh, understands it and it's what's some of the sentiment around this table and some of the sentiment that was said previously uh, is that there is nothing 
stopping individuals from forming their own group independent of the city to discuss issues. In fact, uh, as we've discussed earlier, there is, there's not only the 50 plus, there's also another senior center. There's, as was pointed out by Councillor Plummer, they're strategic partners. Um, so uh, I encourage uh, individuals that want to come together, want to um, share ideas and so forth, but um, I encourage them to do that, but not with a council member present, not with a uh, staff uh, um, uh, appointment to it, uh, but certainly uh, they can certainly do that without any of that. And I, I just want to be clear because um, I can tell you that, uh, I've been stopped uh, since uh, back in, in December, and yes, it feels like rehashing this over and over again but uh, one senior stopped me I was outside of the drugstore and she said can you tell me what is it that that uh, what you're trying to accomplish so we had a discussion uh, and she says oh you need to communicate that and I thought well I, I'm, I'm trying to communicate that so uh, so I'm trying this evening to say to be perfectly clear that I have the utmost respect for seniors and clearly uh, value their their input I value everyone's input which, which is the next, you know, in terms of where I'm going with this is as council members and a few council members have touched upon it tonight, uh, whether it's cell phones, emails, letters, what have you, certainly I know I get it all. I know you must get it all uh, in terms of individuals reaching out to you saying, what about my taxes? What about my road? What about my what have you? And that's what the public uh, does. And I expect that when you, when you get elected and it, it doesn't stop at whenever you're campaigning for the election, after that's over, you're going to continue to receive input from community members and that's what comes with it. Um, so in addition to that, all of us sit on different committees, different organizations, and because of that, it gives us the ability to um, understand what different segments of our uh, ratepayers has to, uh, to say to us. And so I know that we all sit on different organizations. I'm with Kiwanis and, and the Handybus and so forth. And because of that, you have varied individuals, varied age groups, and they're all coming forward and they're all telling you different things so that you can advocate for them uh, with the county, the province, the federal government. Uh, so you can, you can do your part, do your job, which is, uh, as an elected member. Um, I wanted to point out about the senior center because it's been touched on and so forth. Um, so last term, uh, the, uh, the senior center, the 50 plus center had some concerns. They reached out to the mayor. The mayor then reached out to me and said, let's go have a conversation with them. And that's what we did. We had a meeting, we discussed it, uh, and tried to work through what some of their concerns were, because that's what our, our role comes with. I know uh, more recently, the senior center reached out to the deputy mayor and said, uh, there's some concerns. Can we meet? He reached out to me and I said, by all means, at any time, uh, let's, let's go over, let's have a conversation find out what what the concern is um, and that's part and parcel of what this this role is is to be open to value uh, everyone in our uh, which is uh, everyone in our community which I think is what uh, one of the items that Councillor Purcell is touching upon is that we, we value everyone um, so going forward certainly as a council we finished the 2023 budget as, as was commented upon we're close to completing a five-year strategic plan with with some pretty hearty goals in it um, we are developing a variety of different uh, different plans we have now chairs and vice chairs meeting with their designated staff we are moving forward but again I just want to be perfectly clear here uh, that I do value the inputs uh, the input from the seniors I value the input from everyone uh, I've never hung up on anyone uh, I, I you know uh, uh, I have coffee here at the at, uh, uh, at City Hall to talk to different individuals that want to have a conversation with me and voice what their concerns are we may not always agree um, but you know individuals for the most part part and parcel is that they want to be heard and I get that um, but again, should seniors wish to, they can certainly form their own group and they can have their discussions uh, and certainly come to council on a regular basis. We have a, a policy that allows for delegations. Um, I believe the seniors center has previously made delegations to council in the past. Uh, parts of their executive would attend and say, this is what we're dealing with. This is, you know, weather concerns or this is what's, what's you know, working and so forth. But in short, in terms of the, the motion that is, that is before, us this evening I, I don't support it thank you so we're going to go around a, a second time and then I guess we can have a vote on it so I, I have the deputy mayor and then I have councillor Keel 
<clears throat> it's disappointing to hear some of the comments. I respect the comments. Four councillors are here tonight that were on the last council. We had a seniors advisory committee and none of these comments came forward then. But that's the way it goes. Um, Councillor Jackano talked about cost and vacation time, full time, staff member. We have a Pembroke Economic Development Advisory Committee. A new committee was created. Is that correct? Tourism Culture Committee was created? Culture and Recreation? You wish me to answer the, uh, yeah. the ped tack was separated so that there's economic development and that there's tourism. So they're right. the same committee okay. but separated now. Separated, separate meetings, se correct? Separate meetings? So again, separate meetings, meeting uh, every second or third month. Okay, so staff member assigned to the committee? Staff member assigned? So I feel like I'm being interrogated. No, so not really. with the <laughs> No, but with the focus of economic development and okay. with infrastructure, yeah. the, that okay. was the, uh, the uh, committees that were put in place. That's right. And we rolled the climate, the climate advisory into the Keeping Bimic Beautiful, which is fine because we have the terms of reference I, I sit on the committee with Councillor Jackano, and that's going to be rolled in, and hopefully we'll change the name of that committee. Tonight we appointed a Waterfront Development Committee with a staff member being assigned. I think um, the least we can do, we had a Seniors Advisory Committee, and then we, it gets dismantled. Um, no one said that taxes were going to go up. I've, I've been through budgets. We can absorb the cost within the budget. We, we, it's very, many, many years we move money around and we find money for committees. We found $575,000 last term to take that dam out. And that was a line item in the budget. That was not a tax increase. There is, there is funding available. There's also grant money available we can apply for. Uh, the seniors, the 50 plus active living center have a paid membership. They do not represent, and they've told me this, they do not represent all seniors in the community. We have retirement homes. We have people living in their homes that are not a member of that, that group. We have the ACFO, Champlain, who have their group. And they all sat on the seniors advisory committee. And it was collaboration, communication. There was no duplication of services. And they, it's the least we can do for our seniors is to continue the committee instead of watering it down and saying, you can meet, you don't need a council member, you can come and present anytime you want. What if we have five groups coming to presenting instead of one seniors group, you know? So Holly McDonald wrote a, a great uh, support letter. I hope you all read it. She says that, I believe that my dis my disappointment was shared by many who agree that dismantling the Seniors Advisory Committee without clear and adequate replacement of, of its functions causes an already vulnerable population to be more so underrepresented, underrepresented and ultimately forgotten by the municipality. Given that seniors have been arguably the most impacted by this pandemic, we would not be further minimalizing them. We should be actively seeking opportunities to provide them with a voice to ensure, ensure inclusive representation and advocacy for the commitment to addressing the matters that affect them the most. The functions of a senior advisory committee would do just that. And I'm gonna say something, I might, I might get in trouble according to the code of conduct, I don't know. But January 3rd, I was not here for the vote on diversity. And I, I, regret, I regret that, but I was flying on a plane from Calgary to Las Vegas to the Consumer Electronics Show I couldn't change my plans. And it was a very hot, heated debate, as Councillor Frenier said. And you made a decision then, and Councillor Purcell referred to it tonight. And we, Councillor Frenier said, we're rehashing stuff maybe. But we should, and it's unfortunate that, you know, that it, the decision was made, and people know, residents know where I stand on diversity, but we shouldn't play one group against the other. We shouldn't say, well, you, that got voted down, so I don't think we should support the Seniors Advisory Committee. I don't think we should support it. No special interest groups. Not a special interest group. They're residents of Pembroke, Ontario. Many residents. 
Anyhow, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Keel. Uh, I'm going to make this one hopefully quick. Let's talk about what we're talking about. I think we all recognize that seniors and any number of other groups should have the right and the ability to communicate with us here at Council. I do disagree with your worship um, when it's thrown out there that anybody can meet and anybody can, can, can come see us. We all know why lobby groups are formed. We all know why associations are formed. Um, I mean, I alone am a member of the Canadian Bar Association, the Ontario Bar Association, the Federation of Ontario Law Associations, the Renfrew County Law Association. We do that because when you put a structure together and you put some organization together, your voice, your voice can be stronger. So I, I don't accept that what we should be saying to groups of people is that we want two delegations at every meeting from now until the end of the term. And I don't accept that if a single person comes before this council, that they're taken as strongly as when a group representing hundreds or thousands of people comes before this council. You do take one more seriously than the other. But I can't disagree with the mayor and, and Councillor Giacono when they're talking about resources. And these are, these are two people that have been on council for a long time. They've seen things come and go in the past. They certainly have seen uh, more tough budgets than you know, any, any of the rest of us. Well, Councillor Lafreniere has, has been here for a time. So let's talk about what we're talking about. If the issue is resources, but we want to hear from the people, I move that the present motion be tabled and that staff return to council with an advisory committee procedure that will minimize staff resources while validating recognition and assisting with appointments and logistics. We can appoint some committees. We can make sure that the appointments process is diverse, that it, that it includes people in the community uh, that are recognized as being experts in their field. We can minimize staff resources, and I have all of the most deepest respect for our, our staff here and, and for our new CAO. I'm sure that he can figure out a procedure where we can formally give recognition and appoint some committees while minimizing uh, staffing resources. Um, so I move that motion. So there's a motion to table. Is there a seconder for the motion to table? It's seconded by Councillor Lafreniere. Point of order. Can you read that again, that motion? I move that the present motion be tabled and that staff return to Council with an advisory committee procedure that will minimize city resources while validating recognition and assisting with appointments and logistics. Okay. So my understanding, so there's the motion on the floor. There's no debate on the uh, particular motion. I don't. I, I saw Councillor uh, Purcell put up his hand. I don't know if it was the same. Did you want it? To re, uh, well, it's been re, restated, but was that what you were after? Yeah, I was just going to re-second your motion. Oh, okay. Thank you. So there's a motion. It's seconded. So we'll call the question on the motion to table. Those in favor? Against? So it's a three-three. No. How did? Sorry. How did? Yes. No, no. So we'll do it again. Those in favor? Against? Okay, so there's a delay. I believe, so Councilor, Councilor Purcell, there's a delay in terms of the equipment or whatever. So you're voting in favor of the tabling, correct? Yes, he's nodding yes. Okay, so it's, it's tabled. Okay. Uh, Next up, we have resolution to support extending funding for the RCVTAC, Councillor Keel. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, first, in consultation with, uh, with our clerk, um, I would seek, because uh, I did give notice of a motion of support, um, in speaking with the clerk, I would seek the unanimous consent of the council that this be proceeded with as a resolution of council. I don't 
don't see any, I don't see any objections, so away you go. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, moved by myself, uh, Councillor Purcell uh, was, was going to second it. Uh, not being here, uh, Deputy Mayor Abdella did second it. Whereas the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Center, RCV TAC, has been operating since March 2020, providing residents of the County of Renfrew, including the City of Pembroke, with an invaluable medical response option for our residents, many of whom are without a regular primary care physician. And whereas RCV TAC has, since its inception, provided over 73,000 family physician virtual assessments, over 69,000 paramedic on-site assessments, and over 5,500 paramedic home visits. And whereas every month, RCV TAC currently handles 5,000 calls, 3,000 assessments, and 1,000 avoidable emergency department visits. And whereas 86% of RCV TAC users have reported that their healthcare concern was dealt with at their first virtual encounter, and whereas 93% of RCV TAC users have reported being happy or very happy with the service, and whereas funding from the Government of Ontario for RCV TAC is scheduled to conclude in March 2023. Now, therefore, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Pembroke resolves as follows, that the City of Pembroke does fully and strongly support the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre as a valuable and innovative tool for providing medical care to local residents many of whom do not have a primary care physician, that the City of Pembroke does recognize that the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre provides an effective and efficient medical care option that helps relieve stress on our local emergency departments, that the City of Pembroke supports in-home delivery of medical services when possible to support our stay-at-home senior population as well as residents with disabilities or mobility issues, that the City of Pembroke believes the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre to be a proven model for the delivery of certain non-emergent healthcare needs as one part of our overall healthcare system, that the City of Pembroke does now strongly call upon the Government of Ontario to continue funding the Renfrew County Virtual Triage and Assessment Centre as a permanent healthcare option for residents in the City of Pembroke and the County of Renfrew, and that the City of Pembroke forward a copy of this resolution to the Honourable Sylvia Jones, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, Mr. John Yakabuski, Member of Provincial Parliament for Renfrew, Nipsey, and Pembroke, and Mr. Peter Emon, Warden of the County of Renfrew. Councillor Keel did uh, a very detailed resolution, very powerful resolution. Did you wish to speak to it? I, I will, uh, Your Worship. I think as all members around this table are aware, provincial funding for, for VTAC uh, is ending. Uh, the county uh, announced, I believe it was last week, that they were uh, that they were putting in $100,000 to keep it going for the rest of uh, the rest of the month. Um, this is a service that just—it's um, not something that we can lose. Um, there are too many people without a healthcare a primary healthcare physician, including myself, who use uh, VTAC for prescription refills for minor uh, ailments. Uh, it keeps these people out of the emergency room. Uh, it keeps wait times in the emergency room down. Um, I really hope that this, uh, that this council, and I know it's only, it's only a resolution of support, um, but I hope that this council will stand, uh, will stand behind Redford County VTAC. And uh, the purpose of the resolution, of course, is to strongly urge the Ontario government to continue uh, funding uh, RC VTAC. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak to that resolution? Councillor Frenney? Uh, I mean, we just finished talking about seniors in our community, and VTAC has been instrumental in keeping those seniors in their homes uh, when they needed n necessary treatment. Um, I mean, recently they received a ultrasound machine that they can actually go into the, the seniors' homes and perform minor testing. I mean, I think this is an atrocity. That, that this is happening. Um, it's been going on for many years that the funding was there and we just assumed because of the success. Uh, I mean, it was covered by news, uh, news in Toronto, throughout the province, boasting about Renfrew County VTAC. Um, so this is, this is something that has to go out and I mean, if one resolution doesn't do it, I, I've always said, you know, make a little noise. I mean, this has to happen and this is, Again, seniors, 
it's going to affect a lot of seniors. Uh, I don't know how many times I called VTAC in the last couple of years because we don't have a doctor either. So, yeah, I support it fully. So, um, I'd ask uh, for those in favor of this resolution that's been put forward, and that is unanimous. Great. And thank you for bringing that forward, Councillor Keel. Very important. Um, Mayor's report, uh, two items, uh, members of council. On February 25th, I had the great pleasure to attend the kickoff for the coldest night of the year here in Pembroke with all funds in locally going to the Pembroke grind. It was nice to see uh, support from all levels of government, including our, MP, our MPP, as we gathered at United Community Church. Uh, I have the most admiration for all the teams and the walkers and the donors that they represent. Uh, raising more than 105,000. On March 2nd, I had the benefit of attending Algonquin College Pembroke campus and having a tour of not only it, but this time to have a tour of the private residences, uh, visiting them with Algonquin College President Claude Brule, Perth Mayor Judy Brown, Pembroke Campus Dean Sarah Hall, Perth Campus Dean Chris Hahn, and the Algonquin College Government Relations Manager Michael Quagish and uh, the manager of the Community and Student Affairs, Jamie Bramberger. We toured all of the different uh, uh, private residences and it was very noteworthy to see the um, informal partnership between the college uh, and the uh, property uh, developers uh, that uh, are here in Pembroke that allow uh, the um, college to succeed, which is, I believe, what it was that uh, uh, the Perth um, mayor was looking to see is how is it that Pembroke uh, does what it does. As always, stay safe and be kind to one another. Are there any notices of motion this evening, Deputy Mayor? I'll be bringing a notice of motion at the next meeting to, uh, on behalf of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario to end homelessness in Ontario. It'll be a resolution that the Council can support. Are there any other notices of motion? Seeing none, Councillor updates. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I sit on the Board of Directors of the Pembroke Business Improvement Association and last Saturday had the pleasure of attending the uh, Soup Fest, and uh, Mayor Jervie was there also. And there was 11 uh, participating restaurants, 11 different kinds of soups, so there was lots of soup for you. And not like Seinfeld, you know, no soup for you. There was lots of soup. They sold out the tickets, and the, the, the money raised went to the Robbie Dean Center. Uh, we're discussing using the farmer's market more for more events, you know, like Christmas market next year. Um, very well attended, lots of good comments. So we want to thank uh, Bethia Summers and Levi Post of the PBA. We want to thank all the participating restaurants. And Nomada Tacos won the Golden uh, Ladle Award for the most tasty soup. Uh, this one, the next one is on behalf of the Deputy uh, the Mayor, Gervais and I. The community garden, uh, people have been asking me if we're going to run a rain barrel campaign again, and that'll be starting up at the end of March and uh, that'll run for the uh, month of April and we'll be distributing them in, in May also. That's our, that's our fundraiser because we, we get donations for the boxes and then we get the fundraiser for the, for the rain barrels. If you have any questions, you can contact myself or the Deputy Mayor. There's a job fair at Algonquin College on uh, Monday, March 27th from 1 to 4, put on by the Algonquin College Community Employment Center. Uh, community watch meeting. Um, We'll be starting up again on April 3rd at 7 p.m. at the Pembroke Fire Hall. If you have any questions, you can contact uh, Mayor Gervais or myself. And Mayor Gervais and I walked in the uh, coldest night of the year last Saturday. And uh, it was a great, uh, amazing that they raised $105,000. So we want to commend all the volunteers, uh, all the walkers, everyone involved with that event for the money for the grind. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillor updates? Councillor Lafreniere? Just a brief update. Um, on behalf of Councillor Jackno and myself, we just want to say that the Civic Awards are going to be taking place again this year after a hiatus during COVID. And it's still in the planning stages, but the date will be June 5th, Monday, June 5th. 
And uh, so there will be notices going out to the high schools and different organizations. Uh, there are separate awards for youth. And then there's also the civic awards. So anyone listening out there, be watching for the, uh, the posts saying we're accepting applications. Uh, it will be available on our website. Uh, I'm not sure the date yet, but I just want to give everyone a heads up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Keel. Um, I just also wanted to uh, give my thanks for everyone that helped uh, put on the soup fest. Um, I, uh, I was there, I guess, at the tail end of it, and uh, still quite a few people there uh, right to the very end. And uh, um, certainly it's, uh, it's a good use of the, the Pembroke Farmers Market, uh, and I'm glad to hear that, uh, that we're looking at other potential opportunities. Uh, I think throughout the winter uh, it's, uh, it's a good gathering place, and... Uh, and uh, I appreciate the PBIA and all the work that went into that. And uh, I also, as the representative of Festival Hall, want to take the opportunity to advise of March's upcoming events, which include Michael Borda, Bor, Borada, an evening of magic and mystery uh, coming up this Friday. And uh, anyone attending, I will see you there. Tuesday, March 21st, Cracking Up the Capitol Festival presents Comedy Night in Pembroke. Thursday, March 23rd, an evening with Mary Walsh, who I think we might all remember uh, from a number of CBC uh, uh, shows. Uh, Sunday, March 26th, the Rolling Stones and UK Invasion tribute bands. And then the, uh, I'll go into uh, April because it's prior to our next council meeting, after the Gold Rush musical tribute to Neil Young, Saturday, April 1st. Thank you. Any other councillor updates? Seeing none, I'd call upon Councillor Plummer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Purcell. No updates from Florida. Uh, no, no updates from Florida. Just that it's 90, 89 degrees so, or, or Fahrenheit, so it's, it's nice and hot here. So, um, Just a couple of updates uh, from Rupert County District Health Unit. Um, as you're well aware, uh, or you may not be aware, um, the Board of Health of Renfrew County and the District Health Unit um, was very pleased uh, to announce last week that Dr. Jason Morgenstern um, has been appointed as the permanent full-time medical officer of health for Renfrew County and District Health Unit, and that takes uh, effect uh, April 3rd. Um, Dr. Gemmel will be remaining till the end of the April um, to assist with his transition. Uh, so that's really good news. Um, uh, so please welcome Dr. Jason Morgenstern um, back to the Valley. Um, the other update is also from Ripper County District Health Unit, and it's uh, in regards to uh, a new location uh, in the town of Renfrew um, for uh, the future um, RCD HU service hub. Um, so that's going to be relocated to 127 Raglan Street in, uh, in Renfrew by the end of June 2023. And that's it for my updates. Thank you. Again, my apologies. Uh, Councillor Plummer, number 12, closed session. Thank you, Worship. Myself, Senator Councillor Jackano, this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiation carried on or to be carried on by behalf of municipality, section 2392 of the Municipal Act regarding an unopened road allowance agreement and a development agreement. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Jack. No, the meeting becoming a closed meeting to discuss a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiation carried on or to be carried on by, on behalf of Municipality Section 239 Sub 2 of the Municipal Act regarding unopened road allowance agreement and a development agreement. Those in favour, that is carried. We are now moving into a closed session.